of the Planning Sustainability Commission on November 30th. Um, I'm Eli Spivak, and we'll open by saying that in keeping with the Oregon Public Meetings Law, statutory land use hearing requirements in Title 33 of the Portland City Code, the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission is holding this meeting virtually. All members of the PSC are attending remotely, and the city has made several avenues available for the public to watch the broadcast of this meeting. The PSC is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communication. Thank you all for your patience, humor, flexibility, and understanding as we manage through this difficult situation to do the city's business. And with that, um, I will warn you that I think at the next meeting, I'm going to try and um, reveal the, the blues version of that opening. Um, so be warned. And I'm going to turn the meeting over right now to any items of interest from commissioners. All right, not seeing any right away. Let's go to the director's report. Sandra Wood, you are filling that spot. Do you have some updates for us? Unfortunately, I don't. I mean, we did a call out for a director's report, but we didn't get any um, anything to report today. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Um, the, I have a question. Um, maybe you know the answer, maybe not on the spot. Is Historic Resources Code projects in front of City Council, have they, um, are there amendments that they're working on? And if so, if you can give an update on um, whether they'll be taking testimony for amendments and when that would happen. Mm -hmm. um, I am reviewing the memo as in my other screen here. Um, so we will be publishing um, the amendments on tomorrow. Um, so we're just finalizing the document. There are, let me look here. There, and these are potential amendments. Um, there are um, a group, eight of them um, from various city council members and will be there for a public hearing on December 15th. So the public will have two weeks to review the amendment language um, and they'll be moved, public testimony and hopefully voted on, a, on the 15th. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, with that, let's go to the consent agenda. Consideration of minutes from the November 9th 2021 PSC meeting. Is there someone like to make that motion? I would like to make that motion. Thank you, Vice Chair Ralph. Anyone else? Why not second that? I'll second it. Thank you, Katie. Um, all in favor, raise your real hands. Let's do that. Looks like we have consent to adopt the minutes from our last meeting. And with that, let's turn it over to um, Morgan Tracy um, and anyone else you'd like to join with you to give us an orientation to RIP2, the famously named project um, in Portland. Um, welcome. Try not to put that to a blues tune ourselves. <laughs> so Sandra, you lead us off? Yes, I will lead you off. So good evening and thank you for having us again. I'm switching my hat metaphorically here. Um, my name is Sandra Wood. I am the Code Development and Urban Design Manager at the Bureau of Planning Sustainability and Morgan Tracy, the project manager for the Residential Info Project is here with us today. And we will be presenting the Residential Info Project part two, which consists of zoning code amendments, um, amendments to the Portland zoning map, and also um, a background map to the comprehensive plan, which we are proposing to amend. This briefing is the first of several meetings the commission will be um, holding for this project. Your next meeting on December 14th, which is an evening meeting, Julie would like me to remind you because it's unusual to have it on, in the evening in the first, the first meeting of the month, um, will be dedicated, the full three hours of the um, commission meeting will be dedicated to public hearings for the proposals that Morgan is about to share with you. Um, I wanted to just take a step back to Residential Info Project Part 1 because several commissioners weren't with us, actually. I looked at our list and, um, um, you know, Eli, Steph, Jeff, and Katie were here for Residential Info Part, part 1, but we have six commissioners who are new to that. Um, so for the, those who participated at that time, you'll remember... Um, quite a lot of conversation about this project. So staff worked on the residential info project for about five years. We started the project in 2015. We had a pretty robust stakeholder advisory committee that went on for over a year. 
Um, it was adopted by city council in 2020, and then we gave ourselves a year for it to go into effect, and it went into effect in August of this year of 2021. When we were at the PSC, the PSC heard from over 1,200 testifiers and held two long hearings for the project. You had four briefings for the project and 10 work sessions before making a final recommendation to city council. Um, over a year time. So we were at planning commission for over a year. Thanks to the really hard work of the commission, Portland really changed the paradigm for how we thought of single dwelling zones and opened the door widely for more housing choices in high opportunity areas. So needless to say, if you weren't on the commission, you probably even heard about it and um, RIP was a pretty big deal. Um, this project that we have for you today um, for, is the part two of the project, and it's just not the same magnitude of that type of project, partly because we've already had the big policy conversation and really set in motion um, um, st statewide, if not nationally, the, com the conversation about single dwelling zones. So Morgan and I, in addition to doing our day job of doing this code project, we've also been to so many um, conversations with people throughout the country who are looking at similar, similar legislation. Last week, we were both at the Senate and at the um, for the state of Washington. I did the Senate. You, um, you did a, a House committee, I believe. Um, and we get requests all over all, all over the country, but also partly for why this project part two isn't as a, a big push as part one is because we have a state mandate and Morgan will talk to you about that. And we have a deadline of June 30th, 2022 to comply with. And I know that sounds like it's really far out, but um, with the timeline that we have set out, which hopefully we will have a vote out of planning commission in February, that gives us basically a, a month to prepare our documents to get into city council for their public hearings before, because we need to be done um, at the end of May um, for our effective date. Um, I wanted to remind the commission that we were here in March um, when we came with our draft project scope and the PSC agreed, as did everybody else we talked about the draft project scope with, that we should really focus on complying with state legislation with this project, that that was like the number one thing to do. This number two thing to do was really aim at achieving parity in the low density zones that we're going to talk about in a minute as what is allowed in the higher density zones that is already allowed because of residential info. So basically duplicate what we did in residential info part one to the lower density zones. So I think you'll find that the proposed draft that Morgan will present in a minute does exactly that. It sticks to the scoping conversation that we all kind of agreed to at the outset of this project. Um, if you're newer to the commission, rest assured that Morgan will share everything you need to know about residential info part one. Um, as they are really the first grouping of proposals um, that apply to the low density zones. So again, thank you for having us here today. Morgan, you're gonna present the whole project, right? So go ahead and share your screen. Thanks in advance right. for doing that. Uh, can you see the slideshow? Yep, yep. Great. So uh, Sandra may have overpromised when she said I was gonna share everything you needed to know about RIP-1. It was a five-year project, so there's a lot to condense in three slides, but um, uh, if you have questions, certainly I'm, I'm here to answer them. So, and there's a staff report. Yes, lots, yeah, lots of lots of project. materials. We, we'll we'll yeah. get you to an answer. <laughs> All right. Uh, so for tonight's briefing, I'm going to focus on the proposals included in the second part of residential infill, uh, which are being developed in response to the recent state legislative mandates. And I'll describe what those state mandates are and, and provide a little more background on the R10 and R20 areas. Um, the parts of the city which were not previously included in the first part of the residential info project adopted in 2020. Uh, then I'll cover the 10 key proposals uh, included in RIP 2, including more detail on how the constraint sites uh, or the Z overlay zone has been modified in response to the state mandates and end with a, um, uh, an overview of our project timeline. So what are those state mandates? There are two. The first was passed in August of 2019. House Bill 2001, also known as the Middle Housing Bill, requires cities with more than 10,000 people to allow duplexes on all lots where houses would otherwise be permitted. 
and cities with more than 25,000 people to additionally allow triplexes, fourplexes, cottage clusters, and townhouses, which we call attached houses, in most areas of the city. And I'll go into a little more detail about what those things are exactly in a bit. Uh, the second bill, Senate Bill 458, was passed in May of 2021, uh, requires that cities allow middle housing projects approved under HB 2001 uh, to be divided using an expedited land division process in order to create more homeownership options. And I'll describe those uh, towards the end of our presentation. Um, so we kicked off the project with a series of scoping sessions, as uh, Sandra mentioned, around March, including this commission uh, and housing partners that were involved in the development of uh, residential infill part one, uh, folks from Proud Ground, Thousand Friends, Community Alliance, of Community Alliance of Tenants, the Fair Housing Council, and others. Uh, the goal of these sessions was to better understand how we should expend resources given the lim limited amount of time available under the state deadline and the relative impact of changes in these very low density zones. Uh, we presented three degrees of possible change from allowing middle housing to encouraging middle housing or incentivizing it. And the general consensus from the sessions was that the low density areas should not uh, just allow middle housing, but should additionally receive the same sorts of other housing options that were enacted with RIP-1, uh, including the deep affordability bonus and more options for accessory dwelling units. Uh, we held two focus groups with builders, affordable housing providers, and accessibility and multi-generational housing advocates to learn more about what makes an effective cottage cluster. Uh, in addition to presenting at neighborhood district coalition meetings, we also presented to the Development Review Advisory Committee, Urban Forestry Commission, and Historic Landmarks Commission. Uh, we sent out over 11,000 notices and held two virtual public question and answer information sessions, which were recorded and are available on our website, uh, on the past events section of our website. And we are also staffing an email and phone hotline to respond to questions as they come in. So uh, what areas are affected by RIP2? The first part of residential infill primarily only affected the higher density single dwelling zones, the R2.5, R5, and R7 zones which are shown in this map in the yellow color. Uh, the state mandates apply to all primarily residentially zoned areas, namely those in RIP-1, uh, as well as the R10 and R20 zones, which are shown on this map in green. So RIP-2 really is the totality of the, both the yellow and the green uh, areas on this map, about 150,000 lots in total. Uh, to provide a little context why these low density areas are zoned the way they are, it's helpful to reflect on the 2035 comprehensive plan and growth strategy. Uh, these areas are located far from centers and corridors, have limited or no transit available, and are in locations with more land hazards and less complete infrastructure. Part of the work the city did with the comp plan update was to identify areas with low to high levels of housing opportunity based on factors such as schools, jobs, uh, transportation, grocery stores, and bike and pedestrian infrastructure. As you can see on this map, the higher housing opportunity areas are located closer in uh, and declines as you reach the edges of the city limits. And much of the low density R10 and R20 zones are in these lower uh, housing opportunity areas. An interesting observation from our existing conditions report was this disparity of home values given the similarity of zoning. Uh, so in 2020, the median price of a home in Portland was roughly $500,000. The median price for a home in the Western R10 and R20 zones was about $788,000, which was about 60% higher than the city median, while the median price for a home in the East R10 and R20 zones was about 10% below the citywide median at $443,000. This table includes race and ethnicity, age and income and home ownership data comparisons between each of the study areas and the citywide average. The highlighted percentages show where the study area had a greater percentage than the citywide average. So the R10 and R20 zones in the east tended to have more diverse, diversity than areas in the west and the city as a whole. Uh, the western areas tended to have higher average household incomes. And interestingly, across both Eastern and Western R10 and R20 areas, there were more seniors and significantly more homeowners compared to the city as a whole. Now this map shows census tracts with a higher relative share of low income cost burden renter, the renters. Uh, not surprisingly, with the higher share of homeowners in the R10 and R20 areas, the relative share of cost burden renters is lower in these areas. 
there are still some areas in the eastern census tracts as well as in Coley where the risk of displacement is still higher. Uh, with RIP 1, we observed this tenacious link between historical federal lending policies, zoning, and household vulnerability. As part of our examination of the R10 and R20 areas, we wanted to see whether there was a relationship between the homeowner's loan corporation redlining map, this map on your screen, and, and the zoning designations. So this map identifies areas where home loans were either more readily available, i.e. in green-lined areas, or very difficult to obtain, if not impossible, which were the red-lined areas. Uh, the grade for an area was based in large part on the relative presence of people of color. However, much of the R10 and R20 zones that currently exist in the city were too far outside the city at the time to even be rated, though some patches of green and blue lined areas are present in the southwest. So that was a little bit of a background on R20, R10 and R20 areas. In summary, uh, <clears throat> the, these areas represent a small proportion of the single dwelling zone lots, about 12% of the total. Uh, they're located at the periphery of the city with fewer services available and more development constraints present. Uh, consequently, the housing opportunity scores are lower here. Uh, with higher rates of home ownership, the risk of displacement for low income renter households is proportionally less than in higher density single dwelling or the multi dwelling zones. And the redlining maps do not seem to be influencers of these zoning designations. Uh, again, going back to the uh, comp plan growth strategy uh, map. The, the zones really reflected the, the presence of natural resources and these infrastructure constraints and, and lack, of, lack of available services. So shifting to the project proposals, there are 10 key project proposals. The first six extend the provisions from RIP 1 to the R10 and R20 zones. And the first is to apply floor area limits to R10 and R20 sites that are less than 10,000 square feet in size. So the FAR limits would be the same as those adopted for, for the R7 zones. That is 0.4 for a house, 0.5 for two units, 0.6 for three or more units. And uh, another way to think about this is if you had a site that was about 10,000 square feet in size and you're proposing a house, 40% of that site area would be available as floor area for the house or translating that is about 4,000 square feet per house. As the sites get smaller, the size of the, um, of the structures get proportionally smaller as well. Uh, proposals two, three, four, and five are about allowing more housing types. So in the top row, you'll see the housing types that were required by House Bill 2001 with duplexes being allowed on any lot where a house is allowed and triplexes and fourplexes allowed on certain lots. The determination of where they're allowed is reliant on whether they're in the Z overlay zone, which are where natural resources or land hazards exist. They have uh, frontage on a maintained street and they must meet minimum lot size requirements. On the bottom row are housing types that were included with RIP 1 that are not required by the house bill. Uh, more ADU options like a house and two ADUs or a duplex with an accessory dwelling unit. Or when a development proposes that half of the units would be regulated affordable to households earning up to 60% of the median family income, up to six units would be allowed in those cases. We call that the deep affordability bonus or the affordable sixplex. Proposal six is about addressing the growing population of seniors as well as making our city a more inclusive community for people with mobility impairments. On sites where three or more units are proposed, one of those units must have a zero step entry wider doorways, and a bathroom and living space on the ground floor. Visitability doesn't ensure total accessibility, but does enable people to visit the home and facilitates future modifications based on the resident's particular needs. So I'm going to take a quick pause here because we blew through the first six proposals rather quickly. And if there are questions or clarifications, I can respond to those before moving on. Okay, any questions? I can't see everyone. So if you raise your virtual hand, I'll be able to see you. Um, Steph. Could you go back to, thank you. Could you go back to the um, uh, HLC map briefly? And I'm just curious, the, the R10 and R20, it seems like, are those, is how much of that is pre-annexation? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so this is a map from 1937. A lot of the annexations in East Portland happened in the 80s. 
Uh, these annexations happened primarily in the 50s, roughly, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, so the, the HOLC is, if I'm understanding correctly, predates. the HOLC is predates. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's a little hard to see, but all these little patches of, of squiggly lines here are the R10 and R20 areas. I had one question, Morgan, maybe in the code detail. In the R10 and R20 zones, if you had an 11,000 square foot site, so there's no um, AR cap, could somebody under RIP2 do like a mega fourplex, like massive? Yeah, uh, so a little, little context for why we selected the 10,000 square foot um, lot size threshold. One, um, unlike the R7, R5, and R2.5 zones where there was a fairly uniform pattern of lot sizes in those zones, the R10 and R20 lot sizes are kind of all over the board from very small, four to 6,000 square foot up to multiple acre size lots. Um, the existing development was likewise all over the board. So picking a number that would not create a, a vast number of non-conforming situations was difficult. And really the a big premise of the FAR in RIP1 was about addressing compatibility of infill. And so when you have a larger site, you could tend to get away with the mega fourplex and not have that much of an impact on your neighbors because you got space for it. Um, and also it's a bit tempered by there's a, a declining building coverage amount that you get the larger a, a lot gets. So the FAR limits and the building coverage limits will intersect at a certain point and then there's sort of a, a, a loss of effectiveness of an FAR above a certain lot size threshold. So we just went with the, the smaller lots in these zones. Uh, compatibility is still going to be an issue, uh, but larger than that, um, the building coverage and height, and height limits are going to control. Okay, thank you. That helps. And I should have said a mega one plex would be just as allowed in those areas. I don't want to. Yeah, um, that's right. And, and they exist. Um, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Then let's continue Erica. on. Yeah, Erica. I have a question. Oh, I'm, I'm, Eric, I see oh. you. Okay, thank you. Erica. Uh, yeah, uh, going back to the state legislation compliance, you said that most single family lots were required to accommodate duplexes and up to what was it fourplexes or cottage clusters i'm i'm just that's a big word so yeah. what does that really mean and can you um i guess what i'm looking for is just a summary of whether or not we do currently comply or if we were considering rip as going beyond what might strictly be required Gotcha. Yeah. So um, when we're talking about most lots, uh, what's in, embedded in that term is the whether whether or not the lot is in the in the Z overlay, which I'll, I'll explain a bit. That's part of proposal number nine. So we'll get to that. Uh, what, what's included in the Z overlay, um, whether or not the lot is on a maintained street. So that has to do with the sufficiency of infrastructure uh, test for the house bill. So it's really about access to to the property. Uh, and then there's a lot size standard, which um, varies by zone. But for example, uh, uh, a triplex in the R5 zone uh, would be allowed on a 4,500 square foot lot, whereas a house would be allowed on a 3,000 square foot lot. So there's a slightly larger lot size threshold for the for the more uh, more units on that lot. So uh, in, in essence, uh, in terms of our compliance, we are largely in compliant compliance with uh, R2.5, R5, and R7 zones, the, the zones that were affected by RIP-1 in terms of these housing types on this slide. Um, but there are two additional housing types that we need to address for those zones. And then in R10 and R20, we, we don't have any uh, any provisions currently for these other housing types. So that's part of RIP-2. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And does this slide um, make sense to Erica? The, the top row are the only middle housing types that the state bill talks about. Mm -hmm. The bottom row is, um, the state bill is silent on, on that. A duplex with an ADU is not mentioned. A house with two ADUs is not mentioned. Um, an ADU with one, a one ADU with a house is mentioned, but that's a, from a long time ago from a different state bill requirement. And the affordable sixplex was one of our inventions also, Portland's okay. inventions. The state doesn't say anything about that. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, so these next four proposals apply to, these are going to apply to all the SEMA belongings on. So a little bit to Erica's point. Um, uh, these are going back and looking at R2.5, R5, and R7 zones, and there's some effect there as well as uh, applying these things forward to the R20 and R10 zones. Uh, proposal number seven allows for attached houses. So attached houses are individual side-by-side -side units, each on their own lot that are connected to each other along a common property line, um, which is sort of reflected in the site plan here. You see the it looks like one building, but there are four units each attached to each other along this common property line. Uh, they are already an allowed housing type on normal size lots. So if you were in the R5 zone and you had two 5,000 square foot lots next to each other, you, you could propose to attach two units uh, to each other. Um, so the difference with House Bill 2001 is that it requires cities to allow these at roughly the same density as triplexes and fourplexes. So, uh, for example, rather than one lot uh, per 10,000 square feet in an R10 zone, uh, for attached houses, it would be four lots. Uh, these higher density attached houses are allowed the same way triplexes and fourplexes would be. So, again, uh, outside the Z overlay zone on a maintained street, and it would have to meet minimum lot size requirements. The second new middle housing type is a cottage cluster. Um, and we we took a run at uh, developing a cottage cluster code with RIP1, but found, found it difficult to um, create a set of clear and objective standards. Um, so these are uh, clusters of smaller detached units arranged around a common open space. Uh, the city presently allows versions of these through a discretionary land use review called a plan development. Uh, so the plan development uh, allows criteria to be applied that can look at siting and orientation and other elements. But the house bill requires that the city develop a clear and objective um, standards like a numerical track for um, issuing building permits without a land use review. Um, these uh, will be on sites ranging between five and 7,000 square feet up to an acre in size. Uh, they can contain between three and 16 dwelling units. Uh, and they will similarly be limited to areas outside the Z overlay zone and located on a maintained street. Uh, to ensure that the dwelling units remain smaller, they'll be limited to a 900 square foot footprint, a maximum two-story height limit or 25 feet, and up to 1,400 square feet of floor area averaged for all the units in the cluster. So for example, if, if you had a 1,000 square foot unit and an 1,800 square foot unit, the two of those would average together to 1,400 square feet. The benefit of that is allowing for the variety and, and um, types of units that are being provided in terms of numbers of bedrooms and so forth. Uh, the units must also be separated by at least 10 feet, uh, but less separation is allowed in exchange for providing more common open space. Uh, a common open space will be required with 150 square feet per unit, which increases to 200 square feet per unit when the units are less than 10 feet apart. Each courtyard must be at least 450 square feet and 15 feet wide at its narrowest point, uh, with at least half of the units oriented toward the courtyard. So this brings us to proposal nine, which is uh, all about the Z overlay. So a lot of, a lot of mapping information in this next one. Um, so this is one of the key determinants of whether housing types other than houses or duplexes would be allowed. On the Z refers to sites that are constrained by the presence of one or several factors like natural resource areas, natural hazards like landslides, and so on. The current Z includes areas in the city's natural resource inventory, uh, as well as landslide and floodplain areas. And with RIP2, several changes are being made to the proposed Z overlay. So the first big change, obviously, is with the additional housing types in R10 and R20, we've got to expand the Z overlay to, to uh, consider those areas. Uh, second, the state rules stipulate that natural resource areas um, to be uh, considered a constraint, they must be both inventory, like in the natural resource inventory, and protected in order to be included. Um, so that meant making changes that the overlay aligns with the environmental zones. And just a note for this commission, since you've recently done work on the E-Zone correction project, the E-Zones that are mapped into the proposed Z overlay reflect your recommendations. So we're, we're tracking behind that project and uh, we'll, we'll modify if there are amendments that, that come up at city council, but 
for the for the time being they're they're uh, in sync with your recommendations. Um, third, wildfire hazards were not included in RIP Part One, but are now proposed to be included, and I'll uh, discuss that a little bit later. And a couple of other areas specifically related to R10 and R20 zones include small pockets of future industrial area, as well as airport noise areas near the Columbia Corridor. Also, as part of RIP2, we are updating the landslide hazard data used in the city's buildable lands inventory, or BLI. The BLI is, back, is a background document for the 2035 Comprehensive Plan. The current BLI uses the 2001 regulatory landslide map, which is less precise and doesn't distinguish between types and severity of landslide risk, like the newer 2014 Dogami landslide data. And for folks that are wondering what Dogami stands for, uh, it's Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. Um, changing this map doesn't impact the proposed or the current Z, as both are based on the same Dogami landslide data, but it does update the inputs for the city's buildable lands inventory. So this will be important um, moving forward for other, other projects. Uh, wildfire risk was not included with residential infill part one. Uh, while, that, while wildfire risk is present in the R2.5, R5, and R7 areas, it was not prevalent. As we added the R10 and R20 zones, the prevalence of this hazard was much more pronounced. Also, the increased incidence of urban edge wildfires over the past few years has raised awareness of the need to more closely consider these risks. So this map shows the city's wildfire hazard areas in red, which are based on a cumulative score of steep topography, type of vegetation, and the density of vegetation. Sites with a score of five or higher are included on the map. For the county pocket areas, these sort of darker, they might look brown on your screen, these county pocket areas, um, areas that were noted as having a high or extreme fire hazard in the county wildfire protection plan uh, were included. The final two ingredients include areas around the airport where the average day-night noise decibel level is at or above 68 DNL, uh, as well as small pockets of residentially zoned lots that are planned for future industrial use conversion. And these two ingredients are almost entirely confined to the R10 and R20 zone. So these really weren't a uh, consideration with RIP1 at all before. So the net effect of these changes on the current Z uh, are shown here for the R2.5, R5, and R7 zones. Wildfire hazards added about 5,400 lots, which is about 4% of the total to the proposed Z overlay, while shifting from NRI to the E zones uh, reduced the number of about uh, 4,200 lots. So here you can see the current Z overlay. So this is what's in effect today. Uh, the Z overlay is shown in pink and the R2.5, R5, and R7 areas that don't have the Z overlay are shown in yellow. The proposed overlay uh, is looks like this with the R10 and R20 shown in green. There's little, little specks of green here and there, uh, but a lot of that, almost three quarters of the R10 and R20 lots are encumbered by the Z overlay. Um, the R25, R5, and R7 zones show an increase of about 2,300 lots. Uh, this table shows the number of Z-zoned lots by base zone. Uh, so unsurprisingly, in that last column, you'll see the percentage of lots outside the Z overlay increases as we move to higher and higher density zones, which is good news. That means we, we zoned it right, <laughs> basically. Um, right. The other takeaway is that Overall, almost 85% of the single dwelling zone lots are outside of the constraint sites overlay zone. Uh, yeah. Was there a question? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, yes, oh, Jeff, yeah, yeah. You have a question. I have a question. Uh, it's, it's more the wildfire overlay that you're using for the, the Z overlay. The, this wildfire hazard overlay. Does it have any zoning purpose other than the demarcation of Z overlay? In other words, if my property is has a wildfire hazard on it, it doesn't. I'm just hypothetically speaking. Am I going to find a consequence at some point other than I can't I can't do a middle housing project? Is there some other 
is, we, is this actually a zoning overlay or I, I'm, I'm kind of concerned what it is and what the future implications are. What is it? Yeah. So there's a, there's a bit of a bit of a story to be told with the wildfire data. Um, it, it, it lives within title 24, which are, is our building regulations. So the city's locally adopted building regulations and the, the effect of having this overlay on a property today uh, is that if you're building in one of these wildfire hazard areas, you would, would be subject to additional building material standards. So uh, fire resistant roofing and siding um, requirements for decking. Uh, it, it's all related to building code, how your, how your building is treated. So no, no impact on the zoning side. Um, one of the challenges with this data is it is likewise uh, about, uh, about 20 years old. Um, but there is not a, a newer version of data to rely on. So the, the state, as part of its recent uh, legislation, is, is convening a, a, a work group of municipalities and agencies to develop a statewide wildfire risk map um, that, that's updated, but it's not ready. It's not going to be ready for uh, several years. And so we're sort of in this place where we have to rely on the best data that we have available, which is this map uh, with an eye to the future, which this could look different when, when that work is complete. Okay, again, one, so you didn't quite answer my question. So let me make sure, will this have this wildfire overlay have any impact at all on a property other than prohibiting, you know, middle housing? Got it. Yeah. So the, it will have. I the, understand your answer. It does in terms of a building structure, and that exists today. Yeah. So that that regulation exists today without an overlay zone. Correct. Without this, without this Z overlay, yeah. But there is a map. It relies on this map. Uh, but to your question directly, uh, no. There's nothing in, in the zoning code other than this Z overlay, which is a restriction on where you can place middle housing. Uh, that has an impact. Um, so, so wildfire data. Morgan, let me ask you a question. If, I, if I've got a, a house in an R20 zone and I want to expand and do middle housing and I, I don't have any environmental constraints, I don't have a slope constraint, the only constraint on my ability to do a duplex, triplex, fourplex is um, in the city's wildfire hazard area. But that just tells me I will have certain building requirements. I can still build. So why would we be using this map? And my main concern is putting it into the zoning code to say on that particular property, you can't do a duplex, triplex. You're going to have to meet the existing building requirements in terms of decking and fire retardant materials, whatever they are. But is there another reason you couldn't do it? Yeah. So first, first of all, I, I want to clarify that uh, regardless of the Z overlay, you'd be able to do a duplex. So we're talking about triplexes, fourplexes, cottage clusters. Okay. Um, and then the question becomes around, uh, so the, the, the exclusions that are built into the house bill allow for areas to be uh, excluded from higher, fo higher forms of middle housing, so triplexes, et cetera, um, when there are hazards present that would put additional property or people at risk. And so the issue really becomes uh, you know, a single household, though it could be large, uh, is likely to have fewer um, fewer people um, trying to exit or evacuate an area when a wildfire occurs. So the, the, the building regulations, the fact we have a Title 24 wildfire map for building is, is reasonable given its, um, its objective of um, trying to retain or protect structures. Um, the inclusion of wildfire data in the Z is really about uh, reducing the the impact of um, potential risk to, to people, essentially, and, and trying to evacuate areas when when wildfire occurs. But um, Jeff, I think that you've probably hit on some of the things that you're going to hear in the public testimony. This is new to the Z overlay. We did not have this conversation with RIP one. Um, I see that as several more questions, and in our um, Info sessions with the public also, um, you know, several several members of the public have had questions about this, so I expect this to be a matter of further conversation during the commission's deliberations. Well, let me just conclude and turn over to the commissioners and their questions. One, I just don't think this is really necessary. 
I don't think having specific building requirements because you're in a fire hazard area means you can't do a triplex. There's not if there's no other constraint. And the other reason it's it's I'm concerned is I'm hearing that the state law about wild fire hazard area mapping is going to be contentious. And people are already getting up concerned about what's the mapping going to look like? What are the regulations going to look like? And so if, if someone's already got that in mind, they've got some vague notion, oh my God, there's this new state requirement coming down that's going to affect my property. And boom, the city appears to be jumping out ahead and putting an overlay on my property that says, oh, you are in a wildfire hazard area. Now, I understand, Morgan, that they already are if they want to you know, add a bedroom, they're going to have to comply. But I just think there's also the perception issue that I'm, I'm nervous about that, which puts me back to my first point. I just kind of think, I'm not sure why this is necessary. I just think it adds a, a level of questions and concerns that I don't really think gets us anywhere in terms of where we want to limit middle housing opportunities. So I'm done. Thank okay. you for explaining. Thank you, Jeff. We got a few other people who would like to chime in with questions or comments on this. So Erica, is just a new hand up or, or from before? Sorry, it's an old one. Okay, great. Um, John L. and then Oriana. John L. Great. Well, I uh, appreciate uh, this uh, terrific uh, presentation. Uh, I uh, agree uh, with uh, Jeff. Um, I'm concerned that uh, from an optical perspective, if you look at where um, uh, this new type of development uh, would not uh, be applicable uh, based on this map here, uh, it's mostly on the west side of Portland. And as we know, that's uh, mostly affluent uh, white side of the city. And so from an equity uh, perspective, uh, I, I would find this uh, pretty concerning. It, 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 I'm sure that's not obviously uh, the intent, uh, but uh, just from a, a visual optical perspective, um, it does beg the question as to, uh, are we really uh, advancing, uh, you know, zoning that uh, is building uh, much needed housing uh, throughout the whole city? Uh, so that's very, very concerning. I, I, would, I would expect if you were uh, to overlay our concentrations of um, BIPOC communities as well as uh, low-income uh, communities uh, relative to this particular map, uh, you would uh, see very interesting uh, parallel from that perspective as well. So maybe I'll just stop there and uh, receive uh, a sort of a reaction uh, and wonder if that was part of uh, your thinking as you uh, thought about this as well. Yeah, and um, well, I, I appreciate the point, and it was, a, it was an issue that was raised in one of our info sessions. The, I, I think a counterpoint to that, or one that concerns me at least, is uh, in, in respect to uh, questions about uh, environmental justice and um, decisions that put populations in harm's way, one of the objectives of middle housing is to provide for lower cost housing. Um, I, I think it's a bit questionable whether that can be achieved in the R10 and R20 areas in general, just based on some of the other constraints that are present. Um, you know, topography and soils and so forth are gonna make development more expensive to accomplish there as well as um, lack of infrastructure is, is going to be challenging. But, um, if, if one of the uh, overriding objectives is to provide for housing that's less expensive than the alternative, then we're really talking about providing opportunity for people to locate in, in certain areas. Uh, like we described earlier, these are low housing opportunity areas, so not a lot of um, amenities or other, other types of um, benefits uh, services, et cetera, located nearby. And then we have the question layered on top of that, which is, um, and I, I'd hate to respond to this question after a wildfire occurs, why did we let so many people move into these areas and put them at risk um, if we were concerned about wildfire? So there's a, a bit of an environmental justice question there. Mr. Chair, if I can, uh, oh, sorry, Morgan, were you, sure. were you still? Sure, can follow up, John. Yeah, yeah. If, if I can uh, just respond um, uh, I think um, uh, sort of uh, what we um, uh, sort of envision is what we get. And, I, and uh, you know, I, I think what I hear coming out of um, 
uh, sort of regional leadership, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, city council, uh, is a need uh, for us to uh, really ensure that every neighborhood has a range of affordable housing uh, opportunities. Uh, I would hate for us to uh, preempt uh, that goal um, uh, by advancing perhaps uh, new restrictions that uh, could arguably uh, be handled uh, at a building code level. Uh, and so, you know, again, I agree with Jeff, I just uh, question uh, whether or not this has to be uh, in uh, the land use code. Um, and so again, I, I think, I think this is going to be a hard thing to sell publicly uh, because uh, the optics could not be uh, much more uh, stark. Thank you. Um, Oriana, you're next and then I'll go after you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to pile on a little bit here. First, with just the appreciation for this really thorough presentation and the hard work that is going into a project that has uh, gone for a very long time and, and been very well vetted on a lot of levels. But I have some similar concerns here uh, uh, with regard to uh, the, the approach of, of fire mitigation through, through zoning. Um, and I'll share those concerns and then actually ask a question uh, that perhaps may be ground that's been tread on before, but I think it's worth making this point again, which is that uh, the the density of housing is not necessarily a, a duplex is not more likely to burn than a single family home uh houses that are closer together do create greater danger but so does vegetation that is not well managed so this does seem like an issue that could be well managed through codes through building materials through a design uh approach uh from a fire hardening perspective it it does seem like zoning is not the the correct place to to address this and i i don't know that i buy the environmental justice concern speaking from an environmental justice perspective that by reducing the places where people can live in middle housing you are somehow creating better protections for communities, uh, it, it seems a little bit convenient. So, so help me understand a little bit more, perhaps more than has already been said, uh, why this is being addressed in a zoning issue. Is that just the state policy that came out of the wildfire bill, or is this something that's coming more from a Portland perspective and some of the fears around Forest Park and what other creative solutions may be possible as an alternative to a zoning approach to address this issue and make sure that we have a fire hardened and safe city in those communities that are vulnerable, but not necessarily sacrifice the opportunities for housing uh, where they exist, even if they are limited. Yeah, I think those are, are good points. The, um, the the concern here really isn't about the structures themselves. Uh, like you said, a, a house and a duplex or a fourplex are gonna burn <laughs> relatively the same way. Um, the, the, the issue that this responds to really is, uh, it's more of an evacuation issue. So. What, what you will also see in these areas where, where there's wildfire risk, which isn't really necessarily reflected in the mapping itself, but it's a, a condition that's present, is the, um, is the street network and, and level of improvements of those, of those street systems. So trying to uh, evacuate an area rapidly that's got pretty poor connectivity and some challenging um, topography and, and so forth. Uh, is, is is already a challenge. Um, and so adding more households every time you add a, another household, we're not talking about places that are real accessible with transit either. So the only way to get in and out uh, is going to be a car, a vehicle, private vehicle. And so you're talking about adding more, more vehicles into the system as, as when, you, when you need to uh, evacuate it. So it's really less about the structures, more about, um, more about the people and more about getting the people out when when an incident happens. So, Sandra, do you want to follow up? I, I did want to follow up and make um, two points. One is that, um, well, thank you for the commissioners for bringing up all of these really great points. One of the things that we found is, um, and maybe I don't know, Morgan, if you have these numbers at the tip of your finger. Um, or if we have them in the presentation is how many properties have only the wildfire hazard on them because I think the west side of the city in particular already has a lot of environmental zone and landslide and flood um, 
so I would like the commission to understand what that delta is and how many of those properties have only wildfire. It, it is significant. So the, the wildfire hazard adds, I, I believe it's about 10,000 of the lots overall, over all those zones. Um, and most of those are, are really captured in our 10 and our 20 zones, but um, well, actually. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I think maybe in an, 5,400 in R25, R5, and R7, and about 4,600-ish in R10 and R20. I've got a... Um, and the other point was that we're not done on talking about the proposals. Um, so I know there's probably a lot more discussion to be had about the, uh, about the Z overlay map, but Z is proposal number nine, right? And we still have proposal 10 yeah, to talk Yeah, I've still about. got one more to go. And, and just a, a point on the, um, on the discussion we've heard so far, the wildfire is, is probably the one thing that uh, we are getting the most uh, comment on and both, both sides of the conversation. Thank you. I, I will throw one more question since we took the time on this one is, um, I mean, I share some of the thoughts my commissioners have already volunteered, but just from a technical perspective, um, it's been a long time since, as you said, a fire map's been accomplished. And I read Title 24 briefly, and it looks like it's supposed to happen every five years. Um, if this were tied into Title 33, as proposed, does that mean that every time the map changes, everyone's entitlement changes through an additional legislative process? I mean, is, is, this, is this forming a, a marriage um, that, I, I'm guessing wildfire maps are gonna change a lot um, in the future, does this mean that based on every five years, someone may be able to do a triplex or not? Triplex or not, depending on the maps. Um, and then the other question I have is, um, but I think the other question's already been, I, I, it looks like this was designed for building code implementation. Um, oh, the other question I had is, does the five plus, is that a made up number or could it be six plus or four plus or eight plus points and each time you change it, the map changes? Uh, I'm sure that if you change the number, the map would change. I don't know what, how they, how they selected the five as a threshold. Is, is they, so is the five threshold used for the building code trigger for roof materials? Yeah. Okay, so you remember, okay, thanks. Um, but is the other question, I got the other question correct that this would create a legislative process whenever the map gets updated, it would go through the planning commission, update the maps, measure 51 letters, blah, blah, blah. It could, yeah, it could. Uh, uh, um, I have to think about the measure 56 notice. Well, if you if you you said that you had to give out the measure fifty six letter already for this project because some homes would be losing their entitlement in the R two point five five and seven zones, is that correct? Yeah, that's that's true. Yep. So that's, that's indicates that this might happen again. Correct. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you. We 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 digress from your presentation. We'll let you get back onto it and um, take it away. I want to make sure Oriana, you still have your hand raised. But yeah, Oriana, is your hand back up? Yeah, very, very quickly uh, to continue to belabor this. Um, what is the reasoning for not waiting for the state maps, which I believe are coming in July? Uh, that might give better indication or more more clarity on this particular front. That'd be great. Uh, I, I've heard a much different date though. I, I, I've heard that the they're working out the criteria which would lead to the mapping effort and that's supposed to be available starting in July. And then there's some deliberation that will happen and then the mapping begins. So the the um, when we consulted with the Oregon State University uh, folks that are um, participating in that effort, he, he was indicating it was probably a good two or three years away before we had a map. Uh, so that said, uh, we also have a deadline of July June thirtieth of this year to to get this project completed. So it was sort of a we got to use what we what we have available kind of decision. All right, thank you. Um, moving on. Okay, let's see. Last last proposal. Uh, okay, so this this is the expedited middle housing land division. Uh, it responds to Senate Bill 458 by allowing duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and cottage clusters to be divided, so that each unit can be on its own lot. Uh, these land divisions are processed differently than a regular land division with different timelines, very narrow approval standards, and virtually no requirements for lot size or street frontage for the new lots. Uh, instead, the way to think about these is more like a building that's built and then has property lines dropped in afterward. They may be arranged to look like other attached houses, like we talked about earlier, like the site plan on the left shows, uh, or they could only have one lot with street frontage with utilities and access to the other lots provided through an easement, like the site plan on the right. 
or other potential configurations which are not shown here. Uh, the key to these land divisions is that the zoning standards will continue to apply to the original parcel as a whole, as though the new property lines don't exist. The building code will apply to each new lot, shared sewer and water utilities are not allowed, and only one dwelling unit may, may be approved per lot. They are also a bit backwards from a regular land division uh, that creates lots for unspecified future development. Uh, for middle housing land divisions, they're creating lots for a very specific building proposal. So, you know, a regular land division, plats an area, then those lots can be conveyed and sold and built on uh, subsequent. For middle housing land division, it's more like the land division and the building permit are, are married to each other. Uh, so they're, they're really part and parcel of, um, to each other. Okay, uh, so cities have until July 1st, 2022 to adopt these changes into their code. Uh, if the new rules are not in effect, then the city has to apply the state model code directly, which presents a number of challenges and introduces more uncertainty and requires a lot more interpretation. Um, so just in terms of moving forward, we'll be back before this commission on the 14th at five o'clock for a uh, public hearing where you'll hear testimony on the proposed draft. And then we'll see you again on January 11th after the holidays for a work session with the objective of reaching final recommendation uh, before or in February. And City Council will then begin their review of the PSC's recommendation in April. And that is all I got. So if there are more questions. Thank you so much, Morgan. I've got, um, Jeff's got a hand up and then I've got a question and anyone else put up your hands virtually, ideally. Um, can you free up the screen, Morgan, so I can see those? Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks. So Morgan, thank you. So somebody figures out how to do this weird new building permit slash subdivision. They're doing a four units as you showed. So they're gonna end up with four fee simple lots, correct? Yep. And Maybe. suppose, well, two hypotheticals. One of the units never gets built. You know, the builder just builds three and the fourth one for whatever reason doesn't build. What happens in the future? And then also if they all get built, are there restrictions on title? So I buy one of these units in 10, 20 years, I wanna do something, I wanna tear it down. We have new zoning that allows commercial on, you know, what are there restrictions on title that follow these lots? Yeah, so this is really interesting, Jeff. So um, yeah, this, this bill is kind of providing an alternative to uh, condominiums, right? So the only way you could sell ownership interest in a fourplex before would be to go through a condo process. And the condo process would include filing paperwork and legal documents with the state uh, and also include requirements for an HOA and some governance structure. That seems to be missing from this bill, like how the long term, uh, what happens to these sites after they're built is a little uh, undetermined by the, the by the Senate bill. So in our in our proposed draft, uh, we've created three new chapters: two that address the land division itself, right, a review chapter and some criteria standards that apply, and then a whole chapter that that says what happens to these sites in the future when someone wants to do something. So you want to come back and put an office on this uh, on this piece of property because it's now commercially zoned. Um, that creates a challenge because the, the land division, the reason it got to circumvent uh, land use review and is not considered a land use decision and has different appeal criteria and so forth is it's a very limited um, residential middle housing land division. You use this certain call out, this very narrow exception to create this, this lot. So if you wanted to repurpose that lot, you would have to replat it somehow. Um, and that's embedded both in the bill, but it'll also be embedded in the um, in the standards. Is, is it a subdivision or are they fee simple lots? They're fee simple lots. They're not a single. Okay. It, it's a it's a kind of a hybrid, but in terms of how the um, how the county will record them, how the surveyor treats them, they are lots like other uh, conveyable lots. And the city is not putting a restriction on title. It'll just be restricted in terms of zoning. So in the future. Yeah, there'll be some plat conditions that, that will be included, but like the residential use, one dwelling per lot, uh, those things will be part of the conditions on the plat, but um, the ongoing the ongoing development 
will be a zoning kind of requirement. Thank you. One quick question, and I can see nothing but problems with this. I mean, I think it was a good idea, but uh, have, have you talked to a title company or have you thought about that to see if they're going to flag any concerns they might have? If you haven't, it may be, if you got, I know you're busy, it may be worth a phone call to somebody to say, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's how the surveyor is going to handle it. What do you guys think? And just not find out down the road, the title companies are balking, going, we, we can't record that. We won't ensure that. We haven't, uh, and that's a good, good, uh, good tip. So we have we have talked to the surveyor and the uh, and the tax assessor's office, and we've talked to okay, we're well, having a number of conversations around how the um, how the reviewers are going to review these things because they are, you know, uh, shifting the review from a land division group to the building permit group, and and who gets involved at what stage is is all very different. So it's it's a bit of a disruptor, but. Like, like you said, I think it's a good idea. We're, we've just got to work on perfecting the execution. They, they didn't put something in there where you can ask for an additional six months to <laughs> yeah. I'll jump in with a, a couple questions. Um, I, had, I had actually assumed that there would be a recorded um, covenant against the property, against all the properties involved, um, that the city would have to devise to implement this, but it sounds like that's not the way it's going. Well, I, the city doesn't want to be part of a, uh, a covenant on on the property, right? We don't want any part of that that con contractual obligation. Well, you have second sync agreements, so you used to, and you have um, requirements that if you have attached townhomes that you deal with the roof water. I, I was thinking something like that. Is that so? The, the city's not comfortable with that. Maybe uh, we'll, we'll 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 investigate that further. Um, but the is isn't part of the Senate bill though. The spirit of it is that we don't put additional regulations onto it that we would on a fourplex, for example. All right, so right. with the spirit yeah. of that, we're a little bit like, I don't know who's there for the consumer protections. I yeah, mean, and it's, a lot, it's, the land division does that. The land division process allows for that. It's not clear within the bill whether we have the authority to require those things. Okay, uh, I was not assuming that it would be, it would just be a way of, it would be consumer education. I mean, that's why the city did the second thing. For sure. Okay. Yeah. By the way, you're part of this fourplex. And if you want to do an addition to it, you're still governed by the FAR that entitles and covers the whole property. Like we're letting people know that if you come back for an addition to add more square footage that exceeds the FAR of the entire four lots, the answer is going to be no. It seems like that that's what I was thinking of as sort of a way that um, a covenant would be educational for future purchasers. You don't get situations where people say, well, I didn't know I couldn't do it. Um, there may be other ways of achieving that, but um, let me go to the, the questions I had are, are, are a few. I think they're probably pretty short and sweet. One of them is um, if someone has a project that was permitted under RIP 1, you know, after August 1st to do a triplex SA, would they be able to use this provision, you know, in July of next year? Um, I'll just rattle off a couple others. Um, <laughs> Wait, can I do them one at a time? Oh, yeah, do one, that's a good idea. One at a time. Go for it. Mark. I'm going to lose track. So um, for... The, the, in the in the Senate bill, it talks about uh, middle housing that was uh, approved. I think it's proposed. It was proposed after July first, twenty twenty two. However, uh, in our code, the way we've drafted it, it would still allow an existing structure, existing middle anything that qualifies as a duplex, triplex, fourplex, uh, to propose a middle housing land division because we're still we're still going to need you to uh, submit building permit application to demonstrate you're meeting building code. So your proposal would essentially be a verification that your structure meets current building code. So okay. yeah, we can accommodate that. Is the Water Bureau okay with lines crossing property lines as depicted in the... Not yet. Historically, they've not been happy with that. Um, not, not yet. With we're, that. we're working on it. Okay. We're working on it. But, yeah. um, and our... And um, is staff, um, will staff put up resistance to the idea of perhaps coming up with a different name other than single dwelling? Um, since these are clearly not single dwelling on a lot anymore. Uh, I, I don't think there's uh, a philosophical resistance. I think it's a uh, project timing resistance. Okay, we'll leave that. It's, for a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heavier lift than you think. It, it has permutations throughout the entire set of city titles. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions on this? Then thank you so much, Morgan and Sandra, for your introduction.
and briefing. Um, I was remiss in asking for disclosures from PSC commissioners um, of any conflicts of interest. Um, we just weren't prepared for it for this time. Um, not to put people on the spot, we will do that before we open public testimony two weeks from now. So um, we will figure that out between now and then what our disclosures are on this project. And um, any other topics? Thank you all. We'll look forward to public testimony um, two weeks from now. Great. Thank, thank you all. That was a good, good question. Good discussion. Okay. Um, well, with that, I'm going to shift gears to the West Portland Town Center plan. Um, for that, we have um, Eric Engstrom and John Fredrickson. And I'm not sure how who's going to start this off, but I will hand the baton over to you. Thanks, Eli. This is Eric Engstrom with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, for the record. Um, uh, and with me is Joan Fredrickson. And Joan, if uh, could you just uh, say a few words right now to test that your audio is working? I know she was having some audio issues today. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me all? Yep, great. Okay. Great. It's the receiving. I, I, anyway, I'll, I'll, I hope that it goes pretty well. Thank you. If there is any problems- so Before we go on, I should ask for disclosures on this project to maybe make up. Are there any disclosures for the West Portland Town Center project? I think Oriana, usually you have one. Are you there? You may have lost her temporary. Yes, I am. No, but my dog is barking. Um, apologies <laughs> for that. Yes, my disclosure is that I've been the liaison to this particular project uh, for uh, the Planning and Sustainability Commission, but also have provided some advising and support through my professional role at Verde. All right. Thanks so much. Um, all right. Back to you, Eric and Joe. Thank you. Um, so I will load up a PowerPoint presentation to help keep the discussion on track. Um, we're continuing this as a work session um, from last time, and uh, I'll get into what the agenda is in just a minute. Okay. And you all should be able to see me entering the PowerPoint now. Is that coming up on screen? see a couple head nods, great. Uh, so tonight's agenda, um, we will continue the discussion of where you want to go with the West Portland Town Center plan. Um, I've divided up the discussion into a couple segments. Um, first, I wanted to um, provide a final opportunity to review um, any outstanding questions folks had about information we provided in, in our memo to you in October. We started to get go through that at the last meeting, but really had, it was pretty rushed. So I wanted to just provide a, a short opportunity to, to remind you what was in that and, and go over the those quickly. Um, the next item would be to do something similar with the memo that we provided you yesterday, um, which was an additional um, set of responses to other questions that we had collected in those meetings and that commissioners had emailed us after the last memo was sent. So that's a memo with our answers to questions and, and we'll just go through um, that memo. Um, and then the bulk of the time, uh, hopefully close to an hour, we wanna be able to spend on um, going through the initial list of amendments that commissioners had flagged uh, for us through email uh, and, and verbally. Um, and, and I'll talk about what that means in just a moment. Um, so starting with the October memo, um, we had provided uh, a pretty long memo with answers to a number of, of higher level questions that you had raised and then some more detailed questions. Some of those topics we're going to talk about in terms of amendments today. So what I'm focusing on here is just the topics that right now don't have any amendments and I want to just br briefly remind you uh, what those topics were and and you know, give one more opportunity for, for if there are any questions related to our responses. So this is the October 15th um, memo that we provided to the commission, uh, if any of you have that in front of you. Otherwise, I'll try and give you an overview of what I'm talking about. So the first topic that I wanted to just circle back to was the topic in the memo about the role of the West Portland Town Center plan how it gets implemented. And, and in that, there was a discussion of, um, you know, where we are in the funding strategy and the resource discussion. And then also there was a list of what we think some of the near term actions are in the plan. Um, so this gets at just generally 
the fact that uh, when we're at a planning stage here, one of the purposes of this plan is to sort of start that discussion of, of funding and how do we implement these ideas. Um, typically, a land use plan like this does not have a budget associated with it to implement. This is the, this is the beginning of that road. Uh, so I'll, I'll just pause there and ask if there were any follow-up questions to that section of that memo. I'm looking for hands and not seeing any thus far. Okay. So, um, and I'll I'll keep going and and then you just interrupt me uh, if if you see hands raised. Um, the second item in there was a discussion of the economic prognosis and feasibility of development in the near term in the town center. And uh, as some of you had raised questions about, you know, is this economically feasible? And the answer we provided that, you know, given current rents in the rent levels in the town center and the lack of infrastructure, um, there is not a market rate. It's not likely that market rate development will happen in the near term as in this this next few years. This is a longer term play. Um, and it's uh, so uh, we want to just make that clear that that we don't think it's very likely that as soon as you adopt denser zoning here that there's going to be people lined up to take advantage of that tomorrow. It, it is probably one or two business cycles in the future. What we're trying to do here with the plan is to stay ahead of that because uh, in the past um, when we're making larger infrastructure investments there's been a criticism that we're coming too late to the table with that with that so um, that that was uh, discussed in the memo as well so are there any questions about that aspect I'll keep going um, the next section of that memo um, discussed the background on our research into a potential urban renewal district in the West Portland Town Center and talks about the research we did there and um, discusses where that sits in overall city priorities. Um, essentially, we uh, did the math to figure out what a district would look like here with our Prosper Portland did. Um, in the near term, their priority is is research around urban rural districts in East Portland and supporting community interest in that there. Um, so uh, they continue to provide information to the community-based organizations working in the West Portland area on this topic. Um, but we also don't think that a TIF district is imminent in the next couple of years, but it's something that has not been excluded for the future either. Any questions on that topic? Okay. Um, the next section of that memo was an update on our progress implementing the affordable housing strategy for the Southwest Corridor. Um, we got some information from the Portland Housing Bureau about where we are in meeting those targets and what our strategy involves there um, and, and how we're doing that. Um, are there any questions on that section? And I guess, by the way, I'll just add that this isn't your, as we go through the rest of this session, if something comes up for you related to these topics, you can bring it back up. But I just wanted to go through this process of reminding you what's in that memo and, and um, shaking the tree a little bit on, on some of those topics. Um, the last item on here um, was related to um, future zoning changes and how we've phased the plan and the strategy of um, requiring some supplemental approval criterion to trigger those those kind of zoning amendments in the future. So part of the planning district was uh, where we're changing the zoning right now. And some of it was held off to a future phase that was uh, going to be um, either done legislatively when the time is right or could be requested individually uh, if you meet certain approval criterion. And I know there were some questions and we provided some answers about why we did that in the in that memo. Okay, if the, there are no other questions around the October memo, um, we can circle back at the end of this meeting about whether there are other questions or topics. Um, oh, I see a question, a hand coming up there. From, yeah. Yeah, I did. I just, um, I went through my questions before the meeting tonight and um, 
And one of them, I had asked about staff coordination that you, uh, in the um, meeting, in the um, plan is a, a commitment from planning sustainability that you'll be, have 10 years of staff level coordination of the plan. And I, I had just wanted to know, I, but I never got any answer on that one. You answered another part of the question. So, and I am really curious what that actually means and um, what, you know, what does that commit um, PSC to? And, um, and I just want, you know, just describe what that would look like. I mean, does it, if what, some of the things that I was thinking were, um, so they have a meeting once a year and um, all these different, people are invited. What if half of them don't show up? Um, what if um, many of the people on the project have retired? I mean, it's just, I'm just curious about how you do something like that for 10 years and what would be the outcomes that you're expecting. Is it, it seemed like a good idea, but I, I was, I, it, it fits with my concern about um, funding, which I realize is not your responsibility but I think it's part of the accountability piece. So if you wouldn't mind talking about that. Yeah, we touched on a little bit of that with our um, more recent memo yesterday. One of the questions was, um, what have we built in staff time for that? And um, that's at the end of the memo that we sent yesterday. Um, there's a couple things we're doing. Um, one is, um, we we continue to sit on the Southwest Corridor um, SWAC Coordination Committee, which is the Southwest Corridor Equity Coalition. The city and Prosper Portland both have uh, membership in that entity and, and continue to staff that. Um, so part of what's holding us accountable is, is that exterior entity, uh, you know, similar to the role of EPAP in, in terms of, of community accountability to the city and, and keeping the city accountable. Um, another aspect of that is that um, we continue to have the district liaison program and the district planning program. Um, part of that role is often staying in touch with community issues in the geography. And, and so we imagine that some of that staff time is part of that coordination work. Um, the, the other thing that is a new um, commitment is uh, we're currently seeking funding for a position that, that would be funded through a multi-agency agreement um, with water and BES and PBOT, um, potentially parks, um, to look at uh, shepherding uh, capital projects that relate to implementation of plans like this forward um, beyond just the adoption. Um, and so, uh, you know, we are looking for essentially more staff resources to be able to push that forward. Mm -hmm. um, we also have an equitable development analyst position that is an ongoing position that is often involved at um, some of these discussions um, related to specific opportunity sites like the Barber Transit Center and other areas of town where there's a similar opportunity um, where we have that ongoing staffing to be at that table. So it's, it's not necessarily one meeting a year where we just check in on each other. There's a number of ongoing threads to this. Well, you know, I was wondering if it would be, if it would make any sense to have a um, amendment to that, to say that it would actually go to the city council. Then I mean that you would ha have, you would be updating the city council on the progress of this report or this um, plan. Um, because I just, I, you know, I mean, I just, I just feel like it's um, they're the ones that are going to uh, they're the ones that um, find the money for these kinds of projects, and they they do need to to know that they've committed to these things, and then um, hear about them regularly. So uh, maybe I'll talk more about that later. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears. Uh, that was a good segue into the memo we sent you uh, yesterday. Um, 
the first cluster of questions that we addressed in that memo was uh, revolving around housing. Um, the first one was essentially what are the other tools outside of zoning that are available to protect the naturally occurring uh, existing low, lower cost apartments in the district. Um, the Housing Bureau assisted with that answer. Um, there's no specific tax program that targets the conversion of naturally occurring affordable housing to be regulated affordable housing. Um, and PHB is pointing out that, that in their experience, that incentive wouldn't be enough to cause to incentivize that. Um, um, they do. Can I do a follow-up question on that one, Eric? Um, yeah. Was, was the presumption there that this would be 60 or 90 a year affordable housing, or was Portland Housing Bureau asked whether there's an option to do a, a limited tax abatement um, that would last for five years and then it would be affordable during a five-year period? In other words, which, which of those questions was PHB responding to? Um, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer. I, I, I know that you know different programs have different affordability um, limitations so um, it so we're not sure that it was deliberated to see whether a property tax abatement with an affordable housing with an affordable housing restriction tied to the length of the property tax abatement might be a strategy that could work i don't know i, I can follow up um okay, thanks the other element to to php's answer here is that um you know hypothetically if if a nonprofit or a public entity were purchasing and acquiring to convert an, an apartment building, they, there are existing programs that they would qualify for. They're not aimed at that scenario, but they would still qualify and, and be considered. Um, so it doesn't mean that there aren't ways to do that. It's just that there's not something targeted to that. Um, the second question was around BDS's role in the in the previous panel that we had, and that was simply because we hadn't had any questions about their role up to that point, and so we didn't ask them to, to be part of that. Um, and they do currently prioritize um, affordable housing projects to the front of the permitting line, um, so that that's a current practice. Um, there was a question around um, metrics um, and what we have about um, um, what we know already about the, the naturally occurring affordable housing in the district. Um, we based that survey on comparing it to an 80% um, AMI. Um, so um, there may be units in those buildings that would qualify at the 60% um, at some level. Um, but we know that the most of the ones that we identified are at that 80% level. So um, that's a little bit of a general answer, but but um, it gives you the numbers there in terms of um, 762 sites on 20 or units on 26 sites. And that was based on actual rent surveys and us finding out what the rent was. And was there a follow up question from Jeff I saw? Uh, thank you, Eric. You, you you did a rent survey, which was going to be my question. Um, yeah, the staff was essentially finding out what the rents are okay. currently. And then th that doesn't necessarily mean that all the units are exactly. Yeah, no, I understand. Same. But I just want to be sure you did some some level of survey. You just said a number that's different than what I have in my notes. Did you say there are 26 buildings? that are 26 sites, 762 units. Oh, OK. It's 26 and 762. OK, it's bigger than I had that. OK, thanks. And I don't know if sites and ownerships is a distinction here. There might be fewer ownerships than that right. but sites. Um, the next question was around um, displacement and affordability tracking over the long term. What do we do on there? We have um, a couple different ongoing metrics that BPS tracks um, and, and PHB. BPS has a role in, in tracking our complete neighborhoods index, and we also track the demographics of people who live in what we consider a complete neighborhood, and we compare that to citywide demographics. And the idea there is we want to see if, as we create more complete neighborhoods, we're not um, 
changing those demographics and driving uh, the diversity to the incomplete part of the city. Um, PHB also publishes annually a lot of data in their um, state annual state of the housing report on affordability. Um, and then in the, the Southwest um, affordable housing strategy, we set some specific targets and both PHB and B, um, BPS are tracking those targets. Um, the next question related to uh, SDC exemptions um, and um, city code does offer full or partial exemptions for uh, affordable housing that's regulated as affordable housing. Um, and there's a website with a lot more information on that if you're interested. Um, there are also uh, the potential for SDC um, credits or, or refunds related to developer funded improvements, especially on the larger arterials. If it's if a developer find them, finds themselves building a portion of a project that's already on the city's SDC eligible project list, there's some uh, opportunity through PBOT to, to get credits that way too. And that's true for both market rate or affordable. So those were the housing related questions. Any, any follow up on those? I see, a I see of Jeff and Jesse. I can't tell the order of the way I'm looking at this. Go ahead, Jesse. Um, I was wondering about the displacement metrics, if there's ever any like follow up with communities specifically, like if they are in the process of getting displaced, like how that is tracked or how that is talked about beyond just what BPS already tracks and PHP already tracks. I don't know if that's something that's looked at in the future, especially for West Portland Town Center, if that's something that we're going to consider. Um, we participate in um the ongoing anti-displacement coalition as a as a table to have those kind of community conversations with different affected communities. So that's one one aspect of that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we participate in the Southwest Equity Coalition, um, which in part was set up to be that accountability to to provide a clear community voice back to the city if we're not meeting our expectations. So those are the two main venues we have for direct conversation with impacted communities. Um, I mean, we are we are tracking the demographics as we get that information and updating our displacement risk maps every few years as well. Um, and um, on these kind of projects, we continue to track rent, but um, but that's not as real time as we would like it. And then just real quick, so if something were to come up with like the anti-displacement efforts, like their team, is that something that would then be recommended to the city council? Is that something that would then come to the PSC? Like what's the accountability um, like framework for that? Uh, we as staff, as a bureau, would have to decide what to do with that information and how to bring it forward. Um, you know, we do occasionally get inquiries from from City Hall as well if there's if there's direct communication from community to their offices. So it, it can work any number of ways. I think the most common thing is that you know we're hearing direct communication from those constituencies to City Hall and we get an inquiry. Thank you. Um Jeff. I, yeah, I, I don't know if this is the appropriate time in, in our agenda for this topic tonight. So Eric and Eli, please tell me, let's not get into it now, but I'll start with my sort of disappointment to the answer. And the question was, what are some alternatives to preserve the existing affordable housing and address the displacement issue? And I got, well, there, there's really not any good alternatives. I'm, I'm going to suggest, Jeff, that unless Eric disagrees, that that is one of the, the straw poll discussion topics later on, if I'm thinking where you're going. Yeah, we, during the amendment discussion, when we get finished with this memo, that's the first substantive discussion that we'll get into tonight, Jeff. So okay. I, I, I would say hold that for a few more minutes. No, that's fine, that's fine, thank you. All right, so the next category of questions was um, around economic development. Um, the first question was around the commercial affordability program, and um, we sent you a link to Prosper's rules for their commercial affordability um, for that program. Um, and the, the question also was, um, one of the questions was, um, 
whether folks had used the existing voluntary program there. And the answer is yes, we've had one use of that and, and they use the fee in lieu. So uh, we don't have direct developer experience with how the tenanting goes because that that's they didn't use the tenanting option there. Um, but the fee in lieu goes back into the Prosper programs where they are, um, where Prosper already has an interest in the building or is, or is doing tenanting. Um, I'd like to just to clarify for new commissioners, if I could translate that for a minute, um, it, that I think what that means is that somebody can earn an FAR bonus by opting into affordable commercial program. And instead of actually providing the affordable commercial space, they pay a fee. So effectively, somebody, a developer pays a fee for an FAR bonus to Prosper Portland. And that's why we don't see what it's like on the ground. Right. There's several options in the existing program. They can um, they can pay a fee. They can do it on site. They can um, do it off site. Um, and right now, um, most of Prosper's program is oriented towards them tenanting development that they've been involved with within urban rural districts. And this this zoning bonus is kind of piggybacking on that and saying, in addition to that, you can enter this program through this bonus, even if you're outside of an urban rural district. And um, in the one example we have, they, um, I believe it was on Alberta Street and they they opted to just pay the fee and, and, and do that. Um, and it's, it's currently an optional bonus throughout the city in the mixed use zones, um, but it's, it's not gonna be very, it's, it's not the attractive option if you're gonna be required to do inclusionary housing, you're gonna, you, you're gonna get the bonus through that. But so it's mostly attractive right now to non-housing projects. Um, the second question was, how is Prosper measuring success in this? I, Guess this was a general question, but um, Prosper gave us a link to their most recent strategic plan, which has some metrics that they are thinking of in terms of of what they what they're tracking. And and the answer that was in that was um, you know, they're creating um, healthy, complete communities, improving access to employment, um, fostering wealth creation with communities of color and low income neighborhoods, and then they're strengthening civic networks and partnerships and maintaining their innovation and financial stability as an agency. So most of their their strategic plan was oriented around those topics and they had some, some data they were tracking in that. Um, also notable that the, a lot of their activities in the last year obviously has been related to providing relief in the pandemic. Um, moving to the next question, um, this was more of a, I guess, an equity question around, is it equitable to use resources to push growth here versus other areas of the city what might, where infrastructure might be less expensive? Um, and you know, we, we called the question on whether this was the right place for a town center when we adopted the new 2035 comprehensive plan for this, for the reason that this question implies, I think. Um, and the discussion we had at that time was um, there was community support for there being a town center designation here. Um, at that time, when we when we had that conversation, there was concern about the distribution of burdens and benefits around how growth is shared across the city. And there was a concern at the time that too much growth was being allocated to East Portland and inner Northeast. And at that time, council wanted to, a greater balance among the different quadrants of the city in terms of the amount of growth that folks would experience. So that's one big reason why, um, why this town center is here, even acknowledging that it may be more expensive to achieve. Um, the jobs housing balance is also another consideration that um, regionally there are a lot more higher wage jobs in Washington County than there are in East Multnomah County. And so providing more growth opportunity west of the central city helps with that um, jobs housing imbalance and to some extent is a transportation strategy as well. Um, so that's that that's how we think about that question. Um, the next cluster of questions was around development standards um, and um, we're going to get into this 
in more detail in, in some of the amendment discussions, but um, just to cover the specifics of these questions, um, one was around sustainable materials um, and uh, related to the materials in listed in table 420-3. Um, that's a, a table that was reevaluated with the recent DOZA project, the design overlay assessment. And um, so there's probably, um, it just went into effect. So it, there's not a near term likelihood that that's gonna be revisited. Um, the, um, the next piece was uh, around a couple different like calibration questions. How did we arrive at 10 years? Why 2000 square feet for tree size and why one FAR for the bonuses? And um, 10 years was selected to, to kind of align with the transportation system plan category that we have. We, we generally bucket the different projects into five, 10, 20 year increments. So that's why we picked 10 there. Um, the 2000 square feet was related to existing code and how we calibrated that code originally, it relates to the root zone area of the tree we're protecting. Um, and then the FAR bonuses are generally calibrated based on our understanding of the development feasibility. So when we shared earlier the economic modeling that we did with our consultant, they ran several different scenarios and we used that information iteratively to arrive at a best fit for what we think that um, bonus should be. Um, there's also some community feedback element to that as well, because it's a mix of what's what's going to be economically an incentive, but also what is the community willing to, to accept in terms of a scale increase. So it's not a magic formula. It's a, it's a little bit of an iterative process with our economic consultant and the community and making a, a, a best estimate in the code. And it is something that, that you know, needs to be considered and reconsidered occasionally and recalibrated. Um, so those were the development standards one. And then I actually talked about question 11 earlier when Katie raised the question about our staff commitments. So um, I think I've touched on all the questions that we've covered in that memo. Um, so maybe I'll just make one last call if there's any other clarifying questions you have about all that, and then we'll transition into the actual amendment discussions. I think we can transition, and it feels like it's been a while since we've gone through amendment suggestions. So um, just as a refresher, these are be, will be some straw polling. Um, staff will introduce each one of the amendments that's been floated by a commissioner or more than one. Then we'll have, we'll have a chance to discuss it, questions and answers. And then the outcome though is for us to give staff some direction on which ones to write up as you know codified amendments, um, which ones to drop, which ones we might want to adjust. So um, the goal here is not to make any final decisions, but to give staff direction on where to spend time and where not to spend time between this and our um, future work session. Thanks, yes. Um, and there's 10, 10 things we want to try and get through. This is a suggested time allocation. The first three are the meatiest, I think. And so we're expecting you'll spend 10 to 15 minutes on each of those. Then the next batch is more in the one to five minute range, depending on the complexity. So let's try and calibrate to that. And I'll, um, John and I, and, and maybe the chair can kind of keep track of this and we'll, we'll, we'll make hints that we want to move along if we get in, if we get stuck. Um, so we want, as Eli noted, we want to review these topics. Um, these came from individuals, so we want to know after we've described this, is the commissioner who's interested in this still want to move an amendment forward? Are there others that support that? Do we want to adjust it at all? Um, and that's where the straw poll comes in. Um, we will follow up this conversation and prepare an amendments report for you uh, or a memo, and that will be uh, provided to the commission before the January work session that you have scheduled. And so, um, we basically want to know that there's enough support for us to bother putting together the details. Um, so the first topic, as I as I mentioned before, uh, is related to uh, subdistrict D, which is the um, proposal that we put forward to um, address the uh, naturally occurring affordable housing in the district. Um, and I want to just 
start off by reviewing um, the uh, types of uh, the, the elements of that code. One is that it limits the FAR to generally calibrate to the existing level of development. Uh, two is that it allows, um, it limits FAR transfers to these sites so that they can't transfer added density on. Um, the only bonus option here on these sites is that deeper affordability bonus. Um, um, so projects using that can exceed the FAR limits. Um, and then um, there's a transfer mechanism throughout the district that allows you to transfer uh, density off of sites in subdistrict D to other parts of the district, um, plus an additional um, one to one. So there's a little bit of an incentive for an existing property owner to sell uh, develop un any unused uh, development plus an additional one to one, uh, and that's tied to um, preservation of those units uh, as regulated affordable. Um, if I understood correctly, the amendments uh, suggested in general terms are uh, consideration of removing those FAR limits. Uh, uh, the second is uh, considering um, not requiring the affordability provision if the new development doesn't remove those existing units, so people just infill without taking away existing units. Um, or allowing the sale of unused FAR up to the base allowance without triggering those affordability requirements. So um, in general, our, our uh, blueprint for subdistrict D is a combination of all these things. Um, although, you know, I think in thinking through the, and they work together, but in thinking through how they interact, I think, you, you know, you could disentangle some of these elements. Uh, so um, with that, introduction, I guess I'll open it up for, for discussion. All right, thank you, um, Eric, for orienting us. Um, I Please raise your hand if you have topics on this one. Um, I will start with Jeff. Jeff, you are muted and fixed frame. Sorry about that. I knocked over my laptop. Um, I started by thanking the chair, thanking Eric and, and Joan. And I guess, Eric, I've asked before, and I've still not gotten some deeper analysis of how this is going to work. If we restrict, we spot zone 26 sites and, and, and really down zone them, down zone their FAR, restrict their ability to, to use their property. How is that going to achieve the goal we want? And I don't believe I've had any testimony, evidence, why that's going to work. I understand in a superficial way, it sounds good. Oh, let's try to freeze these buildings as they are. But I, I don't believe it's going to achieve the goal. I think it's unfair to the property owners. I, I don't think it's going to address the, the real issue about preserving these these older low density apartments and so what i didn't hear was some alternative ideas and i'm disappointed i mean we've been talking displacement for at least three years and we've seen like all we do is have maps and discussions and we haven't seen an action item a plan a solution and i'm proposing we have an opportunity now i learned today we're up to 760 units that fall into the sub d category of you know, naturally occurring affordable housing. I presume these are mostly older, low density apartments. If we went to the housing bureau and said, we have to replace 760 units of affordable housing at their normal number of roughly $140,000 in bond money, we'd be spending over $100 million to produce 760 housing units. We should be able to preserve these for a hell of a lot less and without and, and achieve preservation, not have some draconian new zoning imposition, that will do nothing. The owners will have to figure out how to maintain the economic value of their properties. And they'll, they'll you know, it's a burden on them, but they're not going to just sit there and go, okay, well, we'll do nothing. And what happens when the properties start to deteriorate? You know, we're lucky in that we have time. This is not a high growth area. There's not land and price pressure in this area. 
And remember, we also have a regulatory program in Portland where they can't raise the rents too far. You know, there's caps on rent increases. There's a process for re-renting. There's a, a payment you need to make to a, a tenant if they move, if you know you want them to move out. So there's there's a lot of financial regulatory efforts on the books today. But I think we need to kind of prod Prosper Portland and the Housing Bureau and our bureau to come up with some alternatives. And I suggest we start by interviewing the 26 sites and hopefully they're not 26 owners, but even if there are, what would it take for them to make some kind of a, a five year commitment, five, 10 years, three years to, to maintain rents at an affordable level? Maybe they want a low interest loan and they pay back when they sell or, or maybe a form of property tax abatement, or maybe there's some way to partner with these people that, that have a, have a public asset, we want them to continue to manage. They own it, they manage it. Apparently they're doing a good enough job that the neighborhood groups want to see these buildings stay. Uh, you know, and I read somewhere, well, there hasn't been much opposition. Well, I wonder if the owners understand what's being proposed and they, they, they're the owners of a resource we want to utilize. Why aren't we talking to them? Maybe we'll be surprised and find out with some very little incentives, they'd be willing to make some commitments. Um, so I, I just feel we have not explored alternatives to this. It's, it's, it's a radical new down zoning, and I don't think it's going to work. I don't think it's a targeted response to the problem we want to try to address, which is how do we preserve 760 units of affordable housing? Again, I go back to if we rebuilt them, we'd spend over $100 million. I bet for a hell of a lot less than that, we could tailor a program if, if we kind of force the partners, force Prosper Portland, force planning bureau and housing bureau to say, we keep hearing displacement's a high priority. What are we really doing about it? And here's an opportunity to say, we're gonna stop the displacement of these units. We're gonna preserve these units and let's put it in place. And even if we buy five years, that buys us five years. And then let's see how development goes in that area. So I, I'm against anything but removing sub-district D. I don't think it's ready for adoption. I would say, let's take the time to do it right. It's a displacement issue. That's a really important issue. Let's figure out how to do it right. Let's showcase this area because we have the luxury of a little bit of time and, and, and investigate alternatives. So that's, that's what my proposal and the amendments here are, are tinkering on the edges of a problem. I mean, they're not solving. It's a bad idea. These changes make it a slightly less bad idea in my mind, but I, I think we owe it. We have the time, light rail's not coming to, to try to do this right and showcase, figure out how do we really do a displacement action plan that's going to work and save these units for the community that's there. Um, and, and yeah, so my, I, I'm again. I would propose we just get rid of all of subdistrict D. And really, I don't. I don't even want to say that. I want to say we need to take more time on subdistrict D. The whole concept of what we're doing for these units and how we're going to do it, and really take a little time to explore alternatives and not take an answer from the housing bureau. Well, there are no alternatives. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I actually have myself down next, and then Oriana. So I'll just start. I'll, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox, but I'm pretty. Eli, passionate. do you want me to respond to specific thoughts as we go, or do you want to wait and then have me give a staff perspective after that? Let's have our discussion first, then staff perspective. Um, okay. I mean, I, I'll, I'll share that I. Um, and I'm sort of jumping in here because I know Oriana will have some answers to some questions I might have. Um, I've struggled with this one, maybe not for the same reasons. Um, the, the fairness alarm in me goes off with it, um, as it seems like the strategy from the city is to cramp down on development options, suppress development options on exactly the property owners who are providing the naturally affordable housing as a way to ex extract additional housing benefit from them in terms of long-term affordability. Um, whereas if you own property immediately outside of this overlay and are charging exorbitant rents for your apartment, you would have no restrictions on what you could do with your property. Um, it seems strange to identify the folks who are doing the stuff we want them to do and screw down their options to try and encourage them to do more while doing nothing to the property just outside the boundary. So that just sort of raises as a fairness thing. Um, also, I feel like this is something really important to community and communities led on this project. And we've heard boo from the people who own these properties. Um, so I, I like listening to public input and we haven't heard Although I think there's a, a strong fairness argument to make, I haven't heard it um, in our public testimony. 
Um, so I'll just leave it at that for now. I'm, I'd love to hear other thoughts from fellow commissioners um, and from staff. Um, Oriana. Yeah, I feel torn on this particular issue because I think Jeff is raising some good points. You're raising good points, Eli, about the, the fairness issue of kind of an arbitrary boundary about what it means to potentially disincentivize people who are providing unregulated uh, but below market rate housing. But I guess this amendment, and I think all the other amendments on the table tonight, raise a question for me, which is, have these amendments been brought to um, the Southwest Equity Coalition uh, by the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability? Or I know that that's a little outside of privileging specific stakeholders, but I would really want to know from the community who have given input on this particular proposal um, and who are most impacted by the availability of affordable housing, whether this does feel like the, the staff's proposal solves the problem effectively versus does this create new problems? Because I think I'm much more likely to support this if it feels like there's some community backing and I'm happy to volunteer to bring these things uh, if appropriate to, to uh, Southwest Equity Coalition folks as a liaison. But I'd love to hear from staff what what engagement has happened around the amendments that are coming from this body to to the community folks who have engaged throughout this process, and what is appropriate in terms of just doing some some gut checking uh, for commissioners such as myself who really care what community thinks about the decisions we make. Um, good questions, um, staff. Do you, I mean I, I'll I'll make my guess of this is that City Council sometimes takes public testimony on their amendments. Um, we. I think may have done that in the past, but it's rare, but potentially we could. Um, public record is closed. So um, anyway, that's that's my quick thoughts. Does staff have additional thoughts on ways to- The, SWEC, the SWEC coalition is aware of the amendments discussion you're having and is probably watching this. So, um, you know, we meet with them every few weeks and we'll be in touch. I'll just add that, I mean, we, uh, we have brought the detailed proposal to them um, first over the summer and then more recently so that they could, uh, you know, dive into these details and they could give us their feedback um, before the testimony period closed. Um, we wanted to make sure that they understood uh, what we were proposing and, and that we could hear their feedback. Um, obviously, we've been open to that for, for quite some time, but, but more recently we've uh, intensified that, that, um, that outreach to them. Uh, and so we have not heard objections, um, but I think it would be interesting. And, the, and then the second piece would be that we have not um, specifically presented these amendments to them. We do, uh, they do know that they are being discussed this evening and we're, you know, obviously sharing resources, but, um, but we have not had the opportunity yet to do a specific meeting where we've um, discussed these. Um, there is a meeting tomorrow evening and I'll probably um, go over, uh, over this material and recap and sort of debrief on the meeting, on this PSC meeting. And um, I'll just add that, you know, the, the anti-displacement measures that are in the proposal were, uh, are there because they were identified as a priority from the from SWEC. So um, th that's 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 why they're there. Thank you. Um, let's go to Erica, and then I I got one more quick thing, but I'll Erica first. I am interested in hearing more from the community groups and from SWEC um, about their level of involvement in the particular proposals that are being developed because. Uh, within the time limits that exist when they, they come and testify and their need to broadly capture um, the needs of the community, uh, like affordable housing, we're just not really able to get into it. And so I'm really missing um, that perspective uh, from the community about you know the, the specifics of what uh, BPS can do within the zoning code to try to secure and preserve affordable housing and what I mean what is their take is that is that enough to me it doesn't feel like enough um I feel like it, it doesn't feel like it's enough because we've heard um from from staff that the market conditions don't really support the utilization of these bonuses and transfers um at this time and that really the scenario 
that would uh, be likely would be for a affordable housing developer um, to come in. And so it just, it seems like there's a lot of complexity and, um, you know, a lot of potential uh, penalty, uh, potential opportunity cost of additional units that maybe could be built and aren't going to be because we put this on, on certain properties um, with, with basically no assurance. And in fact, where it sounds like everything I've heard is that we're pretty confident nobody is going to take advantage of this and we haven't heard from the property owners. So um, I'm really, uh, I don't uh, feel good about, um, you know, going against this or, or saying that, you know, oh, I think we should remove the FAR limits because it feels like the main anti-displacement tool. But I think that that just goes to say that there, there isn't enough happening and that we need to um, we need to find ways, we need to put more pressure on PHP or Prosper Portland, um, find other alternatives that are really actually going to yield the units that we need. And I just don't think that this does. Thank you. Um, my additional comment was, it feels to me like the zoning code approach on this is a pretty heavy stick and a pretty weak carrot or set of carrots. Um, I think that the, I would love to have see if we can get Portland Housing Bureau to do a little more thinking to see whether there's a, um, a property tax or other format of incentive um, that would be tied in duration to the um, homes um, that would remain regulated affordable during that time or something like that. This came up during the mobile home park project. There was a property owner who was saying, well, if my property taxes went down, I could make this more affordable. Um, this might be a, a project worth exploring that. Um, and I think that I, I love the comments about trying to get feedback. We're gonna to continue to have community led projects and we'll continue to come up um, where we have ideas that are different from what community suggested, and we're going to want to be able to test that and find out. So I'm not sure the best process for handling that as a PSC, but we should figure that out. Um, this is a good project to try it. Um, Jesse. Yeah, um, I just wanted to jump in real quick because some of the things that I was proposing just looking at um, are kind of coming from the same place of being concerned that some of the things that we have looked at so far won't be enough to really meet the community's needs in terms of anti-displacement needs and having like big enough proposals that are actually on par with what this community needs in terms of having affordable housing. Uh, so not anything that I propose like needs to happen by any means, um, but I'm really interested in having these conversations of what the community hopes to see and whether we think these actual tangible things that we're setting out will achieve those. And I don't know if that needs to come in the role of us having some larger conversation with people who have done really cool projects that have been able to achieve like anti-displacement work as well as bringing the community and helping them like see all of these various options and deciding what works best for this specific area or what that is. But it's it feels like a lot of the things that we have on the table right now might like chip away at some of these anti-displacement issues, but it won't necessarily um, really lay the groundwork for like bigger lasting um, affordable housing in this area. So I don't know what the solution is to that exactly, but I, I do feel like some of the things that we're looking at aren't necessarily looking at the bigger picture and we're only looking at the picture from like what we're able to see rather than what community is actually experiencing here. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. I'm seeing Steph's hand up and then um, after Steph, um, if anyone else jump in, please do so. And then we'll try and sort of take the pulse of the PSC on this issue. Steph. Um, thank you. Uh, I I agree with, I, I just mostly want to nod loudly uh, uh, related to what other commissioners have said. Um, I think that in, in these processes, you have, you know, one or two commissioners that are uh, identified as ones who are supporting a specific um, idea and and others are nodding silently and um so i am nodding loudly uh i think that they uh, we often especially in in going from hearing to work session um we're caught in this um in this moment of the op the absence of opposition suggesting a presence of support and that there is a gap between those so um so yeah, it, I, I appreciate Eli's thoughts uh, in particular of wanting to, um, to see how we can truth test 
um, some some ideas so that we can get to a shared understanding of what is what is I think we've heard what there what the needs are and now we're looking at what is viability. Thank you. Um, so at this point, um, we have an opportunity. So we have some concept amendments um, presented. Um, I guess we have got a few. Um, one one path suggested is to drop these overlays entirely, and, um, and encourage the housing bureau to explore other non-zoning ways of preserving affordable housing there. Another choice is for city staff to. Um, sort of find a middle ground, which would be what these amendments, I think, might do and codify it. Um, a third chance would be to um, to hold and figure out a way to check in with community on these to see whether they might, um, after hearing our discussion, have other ideas. Um, I um, This is actually where helpful. I, I appreciate some people have turned their screens on. If you could turn your screen on, if you're at a place that works, it helps me sort of figure out how to resolve things. So. Um, I'm going to see if, if any of those three options, if someone to propose one of those for some Eli, can I provide one more bit of staff context that I think is super Absolutely. important to this discussion? So um, the city council adopted a housing strategy for the Southwest Quarter. That's, that's something that staff developed over two and a half years. It went to the PSC and it was adopted um, and accepted by both the city of Tigard and Portland. So we have a housing strategy for the corridor and it has a dozen or more strategies that get at this issue. Um, the, the zoning code element is one of those. So I wanna be clear that staff is not trying to sell this zoning provision as the solution to anti-displacement in this town center. It's one of a dozen different ideas that were identified in the housing strategy. Um, so I, I would encourage the commission to go back and read the strategy in terms of what are the other actions that we have already identified and are exploring. Um, the number one strategy is to get more resources for acquisition and construction of new housing. And that's partly why we were exploring the TIF district here. Um, and that's that's probably the, the number one strategy behind all this is that that um, is to, to end up with projects where, where someone's acquiring and converting a, a, a property. Um, and that could be either with TIF money or with housing bond money or other existing PHP resources. Um, so that continues to be part of the strategy and that's that's part of what PHP is doing is, is looking at proposals in, in, in this corridor and in other places in the city as, as they go through their housing bond process. Um, we also had a proposal in the, in the housing strategy to um, provide some city funding to a statewide private uh, fund that that is more specifically targeted at NOAA acquisition. Um, we brought that strategy to city council and they declined to implement that. Um, they, they did not fund that. So that's one element of the strategy that we recommended that did not go forward. Um, and then again, this this zoning idea was one, but it's 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 viewed more as a part of a whole strategy, not like the solution, it's definitely not going to be the solution. Can I just add that? Um, so this is this is one mechanism to uh, try to encourage retention of existing affordable housing. We recognize that it won't be something that that works on every site, and many of these sites will just continue to operate as they do today, as they have for the past forty years. Um, you know, just providing housing and they can upgrade and raise rents. And the, none of these zoning provisions interferes with that ability, their ability to continue to operate as they do today. It is one uh, set of additional options for them to look differently at redevelopment of their sites. So this introduces a new set of of options and um, and that is why we think it will be a good complement to everything else that's that's proposed for the corridor and that we're trying to continue to push forward in terms of um, you know nonprofits partnerships bond funding etc. So that's just another um, additional point to make. Thank you. Um, I see Jeff's Eric. Is your hand still up, or is it a new one? Okay, um, let's go to Jeff, and then I'm going to try to try and get a straw poll out of us. 
I'm Jeff. I'm I was saying I understand the broad objectives that Joan and Eric talked about. I mean, of course, one, they were laid out when there's billions of dollars on the table for the light rail project. So that's a major change. But more importantly, one, I don't know, is there a single action item that discusses what do we do about 760 units of privately owned, non-subsidized affordable housing? Because that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about how much money, you know, what Housing Bureau is going to do to build new housing. You know, I think we're ducking the core issue is how can, in, a, in an effective, fair way, what do we do about 760 units? And to, and to say to the property owners, you're, you're taking away their ability to redevelop, which may be a short-term issue or long-term issue. We don't know because we haven't reached out and talked to these people and made us our partners. We want them to be partners with the city, but we're not bringing them to the table and asking them. And I think until we do that, I, I think we should, Subdistrict D is such an integral part of the plan. I think the plan goes should go on hold while we, we, we analyze alternatives to Subdistrict D. And maybe at the end of the day, we keep it, but I think we need to analyze alternatives. I think there can be some small strategies that yield big results. I think we need to talk to the property owners. We need to look at, are there targeted property tax abatements, targeted SDC, targeted loans, zero interest loans that they pay back in the future. You know, all of these financial tools are a lot less expensive than building a new unit of affordable housing. And so I, I, I would only support, I, I don't think we, we just yank subdistrict D and move the plan forward. I think that would be unfair to the community that, as you've said, consider subdistrict D a high priority. I think we recognize the importance of what subdistrict D is trying to accomplish, accomplish and recognize it's going to take a little time to, to work on subdistrict D. I'm using that shorthand for displacement and preservation. And it takes some time to analyze, to reach out to the property owners, reach back out to the community and see what we can come up with that might work. It might be effective. It might be a template for future projects like this. So I, I don't want to pull it without, I prefer, I don't want to pull it. I think we should recognize it's important and, and take a side step. We have the time and put together a small committee, investigate, analyze, and, and look at ways to tackle this problem that reaches a solution that works. Oriana? Yeah, I wonder, Jeff, if you'd consider a friendly amendment here, kind of in the spirit of what you were just saying. That Since rather I than didn't make an amendment, I'm just throwing out an idea. But sure, what do you think? I'm going to build on your idea, maybe then. Um, but uh, kind of as an alternative to these amendments requested, perhaps, is what I should say, which would be, I, I'd like to hear from staff what options there might be to do some more formal analysis or exploration with community or kind of take what Jeff was just saying in terms of trying to figure out like how we really effectively preserve affordable housing that is unregulated and already on the market and below market rate um what what options would we have to to encourage some exploration and really utilizing southwest equity coalition as a test case and one that really looks at the tenant advocates like cat who are involved with SWEC, but also what what may be the barriers that come up for property owners in this community to uh, maintaining affordable housing because uh, I think it's it's not just a zoning thing which does get outside of BPS's control uh, and and jurisdiction and more maybe into the prosper or, um, PHB end of things but it, it seems like we need some more creative solutions and what I'm hearing in this discussion is that we don't quite have them and that that exploration may be very valuable to this particular project. I'm seeing this is where the visual language is good. So thank you. Um, and um, so I guess what I'm hearing, and I'm going to just bounce it to fellow commissioners to see if we're agreeing on this, is that it's probably not the right time for staff to try and write up amendments on this. Um, the time is now to um, confer with um, PHB, other folks about seeing uh, alternative strategies to preserve affordability of housing in this district. Um, and and check in with community groups. Is that, can people give a thumbs up, thumbs down on that? Okay. Um, so Eric, is that something that with time staff can work on? 
I'm not sure how to interpret that, to be honest. I, okay. To me, what I'm hearing when I hear that is that you want us to redo the housing strategy, which was a two-year strategy and has a dozen different ideas around this. So I, I need more clarity on what you want out of that. Fair question. Different. I'm going to push that to um, Oriana and then Jeff. Yeah, I, I think for me, it is less redoing things or like doing a completely new analysis because I want to honor the hard work that went into staff's proposal here and also the good community engagement. But maybe there's a way to kind of create a hook for future work, which I, I know is not always advisable if it can't be resourced to the point that Katie, I think, has been raising really well through this project. But I guess my question for you, Eric, is like, what could be a hook for future exploration on this particular front and utilizing this as a test case without going back to the drawing board in a time frame that is maybe not reasonable? Um, acknowledging that I think we all agree that this is an important section, but one that has a lot of complications and nuance and that this would be a good opportunity for further discussion. Maybe even, I don't know if it's appropriate to suggest that this is something that uh, staff bring uh, in partnership with the Anti-Displacement Coalition, but it does feel like it would be nice to include something in this proposal, or maybe it's just something that gets included in our letter that, that talks about the need to explore new and creative strategies that help amplify and support uh, what exists in staff proposals on this front. I guess what I could see as, as useful as, as a next step in, in response to that is, is um, a deeper dive on what the housing strategy suggested about the NOAA um, and to really go through that with you all to, so that you understand what we already have in play. Um, I think that would be helpful for our education, but I think that Jeff also tossed out some specific ideas for um, elements of our housing strategy that might not be in the current version. Um, I think, can work. I jump in, Eric and I, <laughs> you and I worked together a long time and I know we, we often don't quite find the right sweet spot. I don't think we're looking for what the housing strategy might be. Or I think what we want to focus on is what tools can all the city bureaus bring to bear to preserve 760 units of housing. These are a precious resource. We want to figure out how to preserve them. The planning commission is not comfortable that your zoning solution will accomplish that. So I'm not sure, maybe we work through the Anti-Displacement Coalition as Oriana suggested. Maybe we go to the commissioner in charge and ask her to write a letter and ask for a representative Prosper, Housing Bureau, PSC, PBS, to anti-coalition people. She convenes a meeting and says, I want some ideas focused on 760 units of housing. I don't wanna see the people living there displaced. What are some ideas? What can we do, you know? And, and I, I get that's I think what I'm and, and you, I think what I'm trying to tell you, Jeff, is that that was a big focus of the housing strategy that was already adopted. And so, I okay. what what are the answers? What do they come up with? Resources. We need to we need to have resources to acquire and convert units. And okay, but that's and, not what we're saying here. We're saying we're not going to acquire and convert these units, at least not in the short term. And that's not what the zoning does. The zoning says freeze everything. And let's see what happens. And we want to say, well, let's not freeze everything. Let's let's find tools working with the property owners in the community that can buy us some time. Maybe we can have a five or 10 year workouts with these property owners, commitments to maintain affordability for a very small, a relatively small price. As I said, I don't know, a property tax abatement, a short term loan, a zero interest loan. A, you know, any one of these tools, and I don't think any of those tools are spelled out in your housing strategy, and I don't believe, maybe I'm wrong, there's anything that says preserving 760 units is the key. I understand one option is buy the building. Great. If Met, pick, that's, we have 26 sites. How, how many are Metro, gonna, Metro and Portland going to buy? One, two, three. That'd be great. Four. Even. We still have 20-something sites, five, 600 housing units. So that, that's what I'm suggesting and focus on it and using the umbrella of sub-district D, West Portland plan, anti-displacement coalition. Targeted, ask the commission to write a letter and say, I want answers in 90 days, six months. I wanna hear five solutions, five ideas and, and kind of give it the high priority. I think it's where we've all failed on displacement. We've been talking about it for three years 
And it's disappointing that all we've come up with is a zoning proposal that says, okay, if you happen to own an affordable privately owned property, you're stuck, you're frozen, we're taking away your FAR. I mean, that's, that's it. As I want to jump in a second, Jeff. I, I think I want to be clear that that's not all that staff came up with. I mean, they-, they the, You're right, the, the, you're right, and I, that was unfair, but I'm just okay. saying, I, I, I want to focus on a solution to 760 units, and I get frustrated in that. We can do, I think as a community, as a, PSC, we can help put that laser focus on, on one accomplishment. And, and maybe that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about tonight. So I apologize, but I, uh, I don't see us addressing 760 units very well. Um, well, I'm gonna volunteer myself and maybe others to reread re, re the housing strategy that this staff put together. Um, if, if there's a chance for us to learn which elements, as you mentioned, the, the loan program, City Council has already said no thanks to, that could be helpful for us to know. Um, I don't remember whether that strategy included some sort of limited duration property tax abatement for limited duration affordability. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to see if that's in there or whether that's possibly part of a menu that's not included yet. Um, I also feel like we need to move on to other topics. Are, are there any other thoughts on this or staff? Does that, I, I understand it doesn't give the staff the direction that you want. Um, so I'll no, I think it, it helps us understand that there's more discussion on this coming in January. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the next one. As unresolved as that is. Okay, and um, Joan, is this one where I was going to hand it off to you so that I'm not the only one talking? Yeah, there we go. I finally got myself off mute. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just uh, go over the next couple of um, amendment discussion items, uh, taking a deep breath after that last one. Um, so the second amendment discussion item uh, per the table is um, it's about uh, the um, RM1 and RM2 zoned properties having some additional design standards um, in the plan district. So uh, 595, 275 uh, in the proposed draft contains a set of standards that apply in the RM1 and RM2 zones of this town center. And um, they are additional development standards. They um, address things uh, related to the residential entrances like pedestrian connections and buffering um, ground floor units uh, from, the, from the street additional uh, street facing window requirements, operable windows, um, the orientation of some of the common areas and so having uh, windows or doors to those com and if there's a common area required having those uh, having uh, entrances or windows to those spaces and then um, exterior finished materials as well. So these additional standards are intended to sort of promote uh, consistent development quality uh, to support sort of the goals of the town center, a welcoming people-centered place, particularly in the residentially focused areas, which would be RM1 and RM2 um, zones. And so uh, questions were raised about uh, these standards and um, whether the cost of them uh, or just the fact of them might hinder um, housing development. And so we wanna open it up for um, discussion. I think the amendment was uh, possibly to eliminate some of these or, or all of these standards. And so I will just pause there and see if there are any questions on them or if we want to just go into discussion. All right, any questions or for the... All right, let's open discussion on this idea. I will open it. I, I will say that I, I think I'm the one who suggested the consideration of this. Um, this is another one where getting feedback from community would be fantastic. Um, it felt to me like great intentions behind um, this proposal. Ultimately and collectively, it would increase the cost of building, which further delays the point. Rents have to get to a higher level before anything gets built in the community in the neighborhood there, um, which I think we heard some, well, we did hear some concerns from neighbors that this would take a long time. Um, by going beyond code in various ways that adds to the cost of construction and could further delay um, construction. So my hope was that um, staff might be able to um, work with us or propose 
a winnowed down list of core items to try and avoid the most expensive ones. Um, and, um, and love to get feedback from community on whether they think that they're, they're sticking solid with the original list or whether um, reducing some of the most expensive additions would still be fine, perhaps with the hope of getting stuff to be built sooner. So those are my thoughts on it. Other comments or thoughts? The silence is deafening. Okay. Um, Jeff? Uh, following Steph's lead, I'm gonna nod loudly in support of what you said. I agree. Okay, any other thoughts? Then I guess, um, would staff feel comfortable? I, I don't have a specific ideas for which of these are the, um, uh, what, what would be part of a shorter list. Do you think staff could propose something on that? Yep. Okay, thank you. Then let's give a, um, a hands raised um, vote to support staff trying to come up with a shorter list of um, places where development would have to go beyond base code. I'm looking around. Okay, I'm seeing mostly hands for that. So I think that, um, thank you. We'll um, look for that when we get to our amendments. Um, next right. item. All right. So uh, discussion item number three is uh, related to the design overlay in the town center and how we've mapped it. And I'm, I'm um, seeing so, a comment from Moriana. Do you want to jump in? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so sorry to interrupt, Joan. I just wanted to add, uh, going back to the last one, one important thing um, as staff considers how to approach the amendment, I think the operable windows side of things is just important to consider in light of the heat wave we had in the last summer. Um, and I think if there are no operable windows, there has to be some sort of cooling associated, uh, just given the high number of deaths uh, associated with people who didn't have access to air conditioning, either because they weren't able to install it um, or, or because it was prohibited in other ways. So that's just the one flag I would wanna have is, is considering the way some of these things interact with uh, the climate crisis and other other things that are coming forward at this time. Thank you, um, Erica. Yeah, I would just I would add to that things that are uh, part of the design overlay that have any sort of human health impact. I think that maybe that's where the eco roof um, piece comes in as one of the options and operable windows. But things that contribute to urban heat island mitigation or improved air quality or uh, ability to cool a space would be helpful to distinguish from other, uh, you know, material durability or aesthetic concerns. I will Thank jump in on, on this thread that um, I appreciate these suggestions. I will note that everywhere else in the city in these zones, these rules don't apply, or where the rules are, you know, the base code. So um, I am open, quite open to the idea of using a this district of the city to experiment with codes that go beyond base code that might become part of base code over time. Um, but I just want to note that um, these are these are items that go above and beyond what's required anywhere else. And so that this may be sort of a time where, as the design overlay was a way of trying out some new things that might eventually become part of the code, this might be the same thing going on here. Okay. okay, number 13. All right, <laughs> number three. Um, so uh, so the, the question came up about uh, an amendment discussion item was requested to um, discuss sort of the extent of the design overlay mapping in the town center. Um, and so just to, to quickly go over that, the, the design overlay, as we say, the D overlay, um, is current in the current proposal is applied to all the mixed use, you know, all the commercial mixed use zoning areas, um, all the RM2 areas, and then to a limited number of the RM1 sites. And those RM1 sites that receive the D are sites that um, front on the main corridors, such as Barber or one of the, um, you know, Capitol Highway or Huber. Um, or Taylor's Ferry in some cases. So um, it is, um, it's currently, as you can see, um, applied in, in a more limited way than the RM2 and the mixed use zones. And so just really briefly, um, 
here is a map uh, so you can sort of see um, in the existing town center today, the D overlay is applied um, to all the mixed use areas. Um, and that's on the left hand image. And then you can see how it's been expanded um, through this proposal um, on the right. And so the D overlay um, is uh, typically applied in all town centers, right? Generally, it's applied to the mixed use and the higher multi-dwelling zoned properties. Um, however, in some town centers, um, Hollywood, St. John's, Hillsdale, um, it has been applied to the, the lower RM zones. So there is some uh, variety of how it's been ap applied across the city. All right, thank you, Joe. Um, any discussion on this one? Or folks would like to make the case for the change? I am not hearing it. So unless I hear it, I'm gonna say that there's not um, a request to come up with an amendment on this topic. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, Jeff, got it. Okay. I thought someone, I'm sorry, I thought someone had proposed a change. No, no, no one's proposed. Scaling the amendment back. request was to discuss it. Oh, <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Uh, you know, I don't, well, with a new area, which is struggling for redevelopment, struggling for new development, we saw that economic data, this is not an area that's anywhere near significant new development. I think it's premature to imp impose a broad area of design review. Design review adds costs. It scares off a lot of potential developers that might be on the fence about investing in an area like this. And so I, I would propose not expanding design overlay and maybe have some policy languages as redevelopment begins to occur, revisit at that point an expanded design overlay. But design overlay has certainly been a damper in other new areas, Eastscape being an example. So I, I don't know. Your hand up. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Joan? I would just add that um, we really, because of the new, the way that the um, the DOZA proposal uh, changed the design review process and the thresholds for design review, we really don't anticipate that design review would be something that would be triggered in this town center beyond really the core areas that use use the bonuses, right? So. Um, so the majority of the design overlay will be using the design standards, um, which have been more recently upgraded and sort of fine-tuned. So that's just, uh, we, we did consider sort of the fact that um, these would not be impacted by a design review. Um, Erica. Joan, can you just talk through in a little bit more detail uh, how the design overlay is applied in some of these in some of these areas, I know you mentioned that on prominent streets, like on Barber, you would have it in mixed use districts, but the RM1 and the RM2, why, why the areas that we're seeing and not the ones next to them? Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Yeah, so the, um, so across the whole town center, the, the mixed use areas will get those. Um, both the CM2 and the CM3 zones, and that's consistent with all the other town centers uh, across the city because we have the potential for um, much larger development. And so, and in the case of the RM2, we did apply it broadly across the town center here as well because we have the potential for buildings up to 55 feet or, or more in height. And so we thought that was appropriate um, given the topography and given the so the general conditions of the area, it was appropriate, uh, we felt, to have the RM, the, the design overlay. And then for the RM1, we only put it where, uh, where those RM1 sites faced those larger corridors. So Capitol Highway, north and south of Barber there, and along Barber, there's a few sites as well. And then um, out on Taylor's Ferry also where we have you know, they're just, they're going to be either, they are today very prominent connections and central connections for the town center, or they will be as they get redeveloped over time. Okay, that helps, thank you. Um, okay, any other discussion of this? 
Now let's do a straw poll. Um, the question is whether we should um, ask staff to contract the um, or remove the design boundary as an amendment. Um, raise your hand if you think staff should work on that. Okay, I'm seeing a, a vote on that um, and I'm not seeing a lot of votes on it. So um, staff, I, you can um, discuss with, with Jeff or um, um, go. Okay, let's go to the next one. Great, thank you. So the next one is um, around urban green features. Um, and that's one of the um, code proposals uh, code language in the plan district uh, to support climate resilience um, and green infrastructure, uh, as well as nature in the urban centers. Um, and it's applied to areas in subdistricts A and B, meaning that it's the it's predominantly the commercial uh, corridor of Barber and a little bit along um, Capitol Highway in the central portion. And um, it requires that where there's new development of over 10,000 square feet of um, floor area, that um, that development must choose um, one of this, these three standards. Um, and so uh, the three standards are related to um, having some additional uh, greater outdoor area and using native landscaping for that. Uh, the second one, the second option is having a greater outdoor area and requiring space for large species of trees. Um, and then the third um, option is for um, having eco roof uh, on the building, a 60% uh, of the roof area. And so the amendment uh, discussion or request was to consider more flexibility with these standards, perhaps add some options um, to address heat island impacts, perhaps more specifically than um, than what's what's there today. I mean, we we feel like they they are. Uh, they are moving in that direction, but there could be um, something more. And so um, consideration of other options such as cool roofs or solar was requested. So I'm opening it up for discussion. We're open to Thank hear you. more. Okay, any discussion on this one? I, um, Erica. Yeah, this was one that I had some questions about last time, and I understand now that these are options. They must choose one of three things, the landscaping, the large trees, or the eco roof. Um, and I, I'm not really clear on how constraining the landscaping area or large tree requirements might be for certain sites or developments. Um, you know, leading to uh, eco roof as being the best or most economical choice. Uh, and if that were the case, I'm just, I, I feel like the, the eco roof can be um, limiting in ways that are sometimes not advantageous to achieving other sustainability goals like uh, solar panels. And so my question um, to the group um, and, and for staff would be, uh, whether it might make sense to add an exception or an additional option, which would be doing so, a solar PV array over a certain percentage of the roof, um, or at least accepting that area from the eco roof requirement. Thank you. Um, Oriana? Yeah. Uh, I think this is a potentially good direction to go in. I think those are three really positive options, but also narrow options. I do think eco roofs and solar are not necessarily uh, incompatible, uh, depending on your design uh, approach and, and the, the nature of the roof. But I do like the idea of including cool roofs or just kind of other things that help reduce the heat island effect. If the goal here is, is adding vegetation from the perspective of reducing the heat island effect. I think there are other options here that we might want to give some flexibility around. Uh, and similarly, if climate resilience is the goal here, then I think we wanna give the option for, for solar, or for storage or microgridding or some of the other uh, options that could go to support a community in meaningful ways. So I think this flexibility that Erica is suggesting is a positive direction to go in and perhaps a request for staff if this amendment is drafted is just getting a sense of what options are out there and which ones feel like they're in line with the original approach here uh, and which ones may be taking it in a new direction that the 
DSC may be interested in from the perspective of, of climate resilience. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna join what's been said before. I Some of the elements in this project are sort of borrowing from pieces of the design um, standards. Um, I, when things were optional in the standards or in points and they become mandatory in this project, my flag goes up a little bit because I think one of the reasons we made some things elective in the standards was because there may be other ways of achieving a similar goal by earning points in other ways. Um, when it becomes mandatory, you don't have that choice. So um, I would um, think this is one of those things which is optional in the standards, make it mandatory. I think we should provide additional ways of achieving the goal. So I support the, um, the cool roof idea, the PV panel idea. Um, any other ideas staff has? Any other comments on this one? Can we get a, a head nod if this is a good direction for staff to go? Raise your hands. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's go next. Oh, Katie, did you have your hand up? For... Okay, I'm not hearing you. I think that. I. You just raise hands for that amendment. I did, I'm experimenting here. Oh, okay. So anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Eli, for the notes, I'm not able to see who was able to raise their hands. Was that was there support for that or not? That's, that's a fair point. Yeah. So let's let's raise your real or virtual hands to provide staff direction to expand the options um, listed there. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of hands go up, so I don't have a hard tally for you. It's hard to count in this environment. That's fine. I just wasn't sure what, what the direction was. Fair point. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, affordable commercial. Eric, this is one is you. Thank you, Joan. Um, so I'm going to take the baton again. Uh, so this amendment deals with the uh, section of code that requires uh, sites that are developing more than 10,000 square feet of new commercial space set aside 1,000 square feet that would be in the uh, enrolled in the Prosper Portland Affordable uh, Commercial Program, which, as I mentioned earlier in the memo discussion, was is currently a voluntary program that's tied to some bonus FAR that applies citywide, um, including here. Um, this would apply in only subdistricts A and B, which is the core mixed use area of the town center, um, and essentially makes that uh, more mandatory for for a thousand square feet for every ten thousand. Um, again, being administered through the, the Prosper Portland program that, that is essentially the rules of which we sent a copy of to you. Um, so the amendment here was uh, TBD, but a, a discussion, I think, is, is what was requested. Um, thank you. Um, are there any comments on this one or questions? Okay, well, I raised this one too. I'll, I'll share my thoughts. Um, I, um, this is one of those ones I love to hear back from community because I have concerns about this um, idea. Um, I think that the, um, it's basically providing mandatory um, sort of inclusionary housing for commercial space, but without providing the um, incentives that we have for inclusionary housing. Um, and I just concern that the, I, I get the intention of it. Um, it seems like the only place it's, been, it's only been tried once in the city of Portland and the person paid to get out of it. Um, I'm not sure that we wanna make this a mandatory requirement for commercial development um, in an area where we're hoping to have the development happen and we haven't seen it play out yet. So that's my concern. Um, that said, we didn't hear a whole lot from um, any opposition in public testimony, I remember, and um, it was brought to us through a community-led process, so I'd wanna hear feedback, but my initial reaction is hesitancy um, for the program. Um, Katie. Yeah, I thank you for bringing that up. Um, I would almost want to hear Prosper Portland come and give an enthusiastic endorsement of this and, and push their program and share with us how successful it is. Um, because I don't, um, I'm trying to be diplomatic and you know how hard that is for me. Um, I, uh, I, I get the feeling that this is not a big project for them or a high, you know, and I could be wrong. Um, they've been trying to do some things like this in Lentz. And um, so I just wonder if this is an important thing or not, or whether it, it could be great, but it would have to be 
a program that actually worked or had um, backing. Thank you. Um, Oriana. Yeah, a quick question I would have for staff either to answer now or in the future would be how would this interact with the potential uh, tax increment finance district? And could that tax increment financing be utilized as like the funding or incentive mechanism that Eli feels like maybe missing here? And then I just want to echo really wanting to hear from community how important this is and how this, this solution was derived from community. I would be very loath to mess with it if it seems like something that was developed in that co-creative spirit. Um, and, and very interested to hear whether there are already uh, incentives that are underway, perhaps outside of the scope of the work that we're doing. And just uh, from staff, I'll, I'll say that um, the 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 uh, yes, the the current program is used in tax increment districts and including Lentz, and that's that's where it originates. Um, in cases where Prosper has a stake in a development, um, they often are involved in the tenanting of that space. So they have a set of programs and rules about how they do that, and what we've done with the uh, zoning code starting in um, 2015 with the update to the mixed use code, we added an optional program where you can essentially opt into that prosper process in exchange for some FAR. Um, and so that's piggybacking on a larger program that they generally use in urban renewal districts. And the zoning code is providing another source of either income or uh, buildings for their program. Thank you. Now, I honestly have not had a chance to read through the Prosper Program, program Guide. Um, if this were implemented in West Portland Town Center, would a developer have the chance to buy out of it? Yeah, we're not proposing to change the mechanism of the program, so that would continue to be an option. Um, yeah. OK. And if they if they use it with the affordable housing bonus, which is the with the, which is sort of the, the gateway bonus, they would get additional bonus. Um, so it's it's not entirely, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess the question, I guess I'll put out there the question of just um, dropping this um, as, a, as an, I guess that's a very easy code thing to write. So um, it's probably not a staff time to, to generate language to exclude this from the project. Um, I would be interested in getting community feedback on it um, after they've perhaps had a chance to hear our discussion. Yeah, I've, I've heard um, commissioners say that a couple times this evening. So, you know, that's something for the commission to consider is um, after you've reviewed, after you receive the, the package of potential amendments, whether you actually want to schedule another hearing to hear testimony on the amendments. And um, that's something that uh, we don't necessarily have to decide tonight, but uh, you could choose to do on the 11th to, to, to reopen and schedule that. And, and um, if the commission leadership feels like they want to go in that direction, we can talk about that. Thank you. Um, well, let's do a, a John out. Yeah. Yeah, on, on this particular one, I, I, I'd be curious to know um, whether or not uh, we've heard comments from um, minority chambers, as well as uh, uh, some of those groups who might have a stronger opinion uh, as to whether or not they think this could potentially further um, sort of economic opportunities for, for BIPOC owned firms. It, it is a real uh, issue as, a, as a, a business owner myself, uh, commercial uh, space is uh, very difficult to come by. And, and so I'm just wondering whether or not that might be part of the strategy is to have more uh, focus engagement. And I'm, a question for staff, I'm, I'm guessing that there's no commitment from Prosper Portland to buy and administer these spaces. Is that, this, there's no put out there. Um, if these spaces are created to comply with the zoning, the developer would be doing the thousand square foot space, they'd have to rent it out at affordable rents. Um, they might get help and prosper to do that, um, but they they retain the ownership and the risk. Is that correct? Um, you'll want to look at the rules specifically, but yes, it's not necessarily prosper buying it. With the fee in lieu, the money is going into the prosper program, and that's that's 
a different kind of that's that's going into the projects that they control or tenanting those. Okay, thanks. So I assume this is not designed to be a fundraiser for Prosper. Um, it's designed to get the small commercial spaces created. Um, no, but it, it ends up serving both functions. It provides a mechanism for Prosper to be involved in projects outside of urban renewal districts, and it and it also in hopefully leads to actual on-site tenanting at some point. Um, well, let's do a short poll. That's, um, I'm trying to think how to frame this. Um, should staff follow up with, um, does someone else want to help me frame a, a, a poll for us? I'm not always the best at that. Okay, it's on me. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna put a poll just to see if uh, maybe I'm an outlier on this. I, I guess I'm suggesting that we consider um, dropping the affordable commercial district subject to additional input from community. So, does anyone else think that's a good idea? I'll put my hand up. I'm seeing one, two. Um, so I'm seeing four. I think I'm seeing five. It's hard to count, to be honest. Um, with that idea. Um, so it seems like there's some interest in, in staff exploring that. Um, is there another straw poll someone would suggest we ask? And Eli, okay. as you said earlier, the subtractive amendments are fairly easy for us to write up and wait to see what happens at the final vote. And we can certainly follow up with Prosper to provide some more information about how the, how the um, how it would play out here. Thank you. And, and for me, and then what the community thinks too, I mean, I think the concern that, I, that I'm that at least myself sharing is whether um, by making this mandatory requirement in any new development, it may increase the odds that development doesn't happen. And I understand the, the importance of small commercial spaces to lease. Um, I also understand the importance of having any commercial spaces to lease. So that's the, the tension I'm trying to tug at. Yeah, yeah and, and from a community perspective, I, I, you know, this and the subdistrict D thing were elements of the plan that were direct, developed in collaboration with community. So there, there was support at the co conceptual level for both of those things. Um, whether community supports nuance amendments, I think that's a that's a follow up question. But but in general, these were collaboratively developed. Thank you. That's a good reminder. Um, Okay, I think, are, are there hands up? Yeah, to speak on yeah I, I was just gonna uh, add additional further uh, commentary. Um, uh, I, I think uh, what, what I would be um, proposing is that um, staff has an opportunity of, of having further dialogue with Prosper uh, relative to this particular uh, amendment. Um, as is referenced, it was uh, something that uh, the community uh, did support uh, and it is a significant uh, economic and, and equity issue. And so I think, I think we would be wise to be mindful. Uh, it's always a, a delicate balance of uh, wanting to incent um, and spur uh, development. At the same time, we want to also create uh, development for uh, all parts of uh, our uh, strata, uh, which has not occurred. Uh, and so um, I think these types of opportunities though uh, may on um, surface, and by the way, this is coming from uh, a consultant who spends a lot of time with developers, uh, on, on a surface may appear overly onerous. I, I would suggest that uh, these, it's exactly these types of uh, efforts that will actually help us meet our uh, equitable and planning uh, action goals. All right, thank you. Um, Steph? Uh, exactly. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, what is next? Oh, Katie, do you have something? Uh, I just want to say that just you know, it, a good a good program is wonderful. Uh, a program that's just kind of not working or isn't doesn't nobody's really putting any energy into it. Can cause problems because then the tenants get in and they have difficulties and you know et cetera et cetera. So I mean, I guess it, it sometimes looks like you're saying you don't want to support a program like this. I want to support good programs, 
because uh, actually bad programs can actually um, hurt people, really. But anyway, that's just something to throw in. Okay. Um, good discussion. Um, what's next? All right. I'm up next again. Um, we are going to go a little bit more quickly, I guess, through these last ones, and you'll keep me, let me know when there's a cutoff <laughs> point. Um, but we're just going to, uh, I'm just going to go over uh, a, a group of amendments that we're calling other standards that exceed the base zone. And so this is really, um, there's a commercial corridor set of standards, residential corridor set of standards, some setback standards, and a retaining wall standard. And we'll go over um, some of these. Um, First of all, the, the first group is around the commercial corridor standards. Um, and we have laid this out in the, both in the table and, and some of it in previous responses. So some of this uh, information will be familiar, but we wanted to make sure that we went over it in case um, there was any desire for amendments. And again, the amendment was, please discuss amendment TBD. So the, um, the commercial standards that are proposed that are additional uh, somewhat additional um, to the base zone. Um, some of these do exist in an M overlay, the, the center's main street overlay. Um, so in terms of the location of the vehicle areas, um, this is the same as in other centers. Um, however, in this case, we are using the inner pattern area standard, which is 30%, which prohibits area, um, vehicle areas greater than 30% in the front. Um, so this is a little bit different in our approach, but it's it's comparable to what's been done elsewhere in the city. Um, the trees between uh, along Barber, we are uh, we have a standard that requires where the building is set back uh, more than 10 feet. We are requiring an extra row of trees in that setback. Um, this is something that is not has not been done anywhere else yet. Um, the example is the PCC campus on uh, Southeast 82nd Avenue and sort of that Southeast 82nd Avenue frontage. So this is would be ap applicable just along Barber. Um, but it would really, uh, it would really provide sort of a more a more prominent appearance and also some other benefits um, along that that very central corridor. Um, and additionally, Barber already has some setback require additional setback requirements, so this this um, dovetails well with that. Um, there are some uh, ground floor window requirements that are beyond the base zone, but that are uh, the same in the main street overlay zone elsewhere, applied elsewhere in the city. Same thing with the frequency of entrances and sort of the location of entrances. Again, those are um, not, they're beyond what's in the base zone, but they're comparable to the Main Street Center's overlay. And so, uh, Eli, I think the this collection of amendments, um, one of the questions that was asked was, where are the, the town center standards exceeding the base zone? So essentially what Jones pointing to is that the Many of these in this category are just very slightly different versions, but very close to what we apply elsewhere. The, the biggest unique aspect here is the tree standard, which is related to the Barber Civic Corridor. Thank you. Um, any discussion on this one? I think I was probably the, the prompter on this. I, I think that this helps me understand the questions. And um, to the extent we're drawing from the Main Street overlay zone has a lot of similarities to design overlay. Um, I'm fine drawing from other areas, and the introduction of the tree um, is not something I'm familiar with, but um, game to try. So I'm, I don't have any additional push for amendments here. Um, Katie, do you have a comment? Oh, I just wanted to support these standards. They seem great, and especially the trees. So that's all. Great. So I, I, um, does anyone want to propose these for amendments? Sounds like not. Um, let's go to the next one. Great. And so the next set of standards that exceed the base zone is uh, uh, a couple of standards that we have um, related to the to what we call our residential corridors. And we what we've done in the town center is designate our um, some of our larger streets that have they don't have mixed use zoning along them. They have um, they have multi dwelling zoning along them. So we've called these our residential corridors. And so what we've done is we have. Uh, propose some standards that um, limit the number of driveways that can be um, from a site out to the street. So the intent is to um, preserve and protect the, the pedestrian way so that we don't have um, numerous 
uh, curb cuts and that we could have a safer pedestrian route and also room for trees. Um, so we have limited driveways um, for sites under 10,000 square feet. If they're larger, they can have two driveways. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's that. And so these are standards that are unique to this town center. Uh, but because of the nature of the the very busy corridors and the multi-dwelling zoning along it, uh, we thought it was appropriate to safeguard the pedestrian um, pedestrian realm. Okay, thank you, um, staff. Very short, big fan. Um, uh, access management is a, a big deal in terms of pedestrian um, infrastructure as well as um, universal accessibility. Um, and that also relates to trees and uh, traffic calming, particularly so um, so proximal to a lot of uh, uh, higher speed uh, corridors in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want to propose an amendment on this topic? Okay, not hearing it, let's go to the next one. Okay, so the next one, uh, the standards that exceed the base zone, there are a couple of setback standards that we've called out that are um, found in 595-270. They are not related, so I'll talk about them sort of separately. The first one has to do with our um, mix, or sorry, our multi-dwelling zones, our RM1 and our RM2 zones. And so um, where the sites are over 100 feet deep, uh, we have um, we have borrowed a, a East Portland multi-dwelling code section that requires that 25% uh, of the site be left open at the rear of the sites. And so this is um, this can be used for any required common area, but it also provides sort of a, a a sort of a more regular pattern for um, for these sites uh, in in areas where that's that's already a, an existing pattern. So the rear open areas. Um, so that's that's that one. And so it is it is a little bit different than what we applied citywide, but it does match what's what's required in in East Portland. Is this the a question? Is this the one where you're not only required to provide the setback but also build stuff in it? So right, so there, thank you for that clarification. So that yes, so there it also requires um, that you choose one of three options. You can landscape it with benches, or you can have a play area, or you can have a, a you know garden plot, community garden. Thank you. So you do um, you can't just leave it bare. Um, I guess I'll put it out there that I I'm fine with requiring the minimum area. I'm I'm not so excited about requiring builders to build stuff in it um, that does go beyond what's done elsewhere in the city. Um, would anyone else um, support the staff drafting an amendment that would um, accomplish, provide the setback but not require you to do stuff in it? Raise your hand if you think that's worth considering. I'm seeing about five or six. So it looks like staff will write an amendment on that. Thank you. Any other? Um, do you want to do the freeway separately, or do you think um, yeah. I can just ask? Yeah, I can just describe it. But basically, it's that it also this applies to mixed use sites along, uh, you know, with their back along um, the the I five freeway in this in this area, and it um, there is a, a minimum site size that applies, so it's not it just, it's not applicable to really small sites. Um, but yeah, essentially, it's it's. Uh, required buffer area that's that's landscaped with trees, so that it's the intent is to provide visual and also some, some air quality benefits as well. Thank you, Katie. Do you have a uh, comment, or are your hands up from the vote? Oh, I'm sorry. I just left my hands up, but I actually, I I actually grew up right next to the I-5 freeway. I am all for this. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it would at least help a little bit with some of the noise. Thank you. Um, Jeff, and then I'm going to do a time check. I think we might need to close things up. Um, Jeff. Oh, that's an old hand. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so I feel like we're on a roll here, and it's also eight o'clock. Um, and this project doesn't have a hard deadline. So, um, uh, can you tell me how many more there are left and um, what our option would be to continue this discussion to next meeting? Uh, so the rest are fairly um, 
easy for us to continue, I think, in the next meeting. And, and um, so that's what I would recommend. I think um, okay. we have good direction for a number of these things um, to, to draft an amendment package. It sounds like from our first discussion that there's going to be more discussion on that first item of the subdistrict D. So um, what I'm imagining is a, a mix of um, continued substantive discussion and consideration of some of the amendments. So um, maybe if I quickly go to the next step slide and just um, cover that piece. Sure, and I see, um, Jesse, is your hand up anew? Yeah, it is. I was just gonna maybe save us all some time on seven, eight, and nine. I uh, proposed those just as more options to look at for community groups. I know it was brought up the tenants rate, um, our first rate of refusal when we had the community groups come and speak to us, that that was something that they were interested in. Um, and I mostly just proposed these to kind of broaden the conversation around what we could do for more community control options in terms of affordable housing and community control in that area. Um, that's obviously something that we would need more community input on. And I think that gets back to like our original conversations that we were having around this. Um, so I'm not necessarily expecting amendments from the staff on these three things, but I thought that it was worthwhile just to bring up to the PSC to perhaps bring that up to the community and see what they're kind of thinking about um, in terms of these options. So that might save us all time in terms of you don't necessarily need to go through all three of those. And it rolls back into our initial discussion, as you said. Exactly. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, well, then let's go to the next step slide. Uh, Katie, do you have something new? Or is it old yeah, man? I do. I, I just wanted to say that I would like to do a, an amendment, not tonight though. I mean, there's another opportunity to do one, right? And so um, around that 10 years of staff level coordination. So, um, so yeah, this next step slide, um, staff would suggest that if if there's last call for amendment ideas that haven't yet been put on the table, um, if you could send us that by December 8th um, and go ahead and email that idea, Katie, and we'll we'll roll that in. Um, that so that's one um, request. Um, we will. Um, work to publish a report or a memo that that outlines that gives more specificity to these amendments so that they're kind of vote ready. Um, and um, on January 11th, we will come back to this. And I'm imagining it's going to be a combination of continued discussion on that first item with uh, cons potential consideration of items from the amendment um, list. Um, we will work with commission leadership to figure out this question about whether you want to hold an additional hearing on the amendment package once we have it out there. Um, and um, so based on tonight's discussion, I'm imagining you're not going to take a final vote on January 11th, that there probably is enough substance in that first item that we will have to find a date in, in February to continue that discussion. So. Um, that's my takeaway in terms of next steps. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Um, so with that, thank you, um, staff, Eric and Joan, for running us through a lot of topics. Um, with that, I'll continue this discussion until the, I've lost the screen now, um, January 11th. Did I get that right? Correct. So our January 11th PSC meeting. And um, we'll see everybody, um, I hope, at our next meeting on December 14th. It's an evening meeting. We'll be taking public testimony then on the RIP2 project. Um, my ears suggest that there's gonna be a lot of it. Um, so look forward to seeing you then and um, have a great rest of the week. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.